It was a quiet night in Noir City, the kind of night that puts you on edge, because you think you hear the footsteps of a tail on your trail. So you keep looking over your shoulder until you realize it's just the sound of your own heartbeat going thump thump down the lonely streets of your soul. We'd had quite a few quiet nights since Mayor Moray was sworn into office. He diverted police resources to enforce noise ordinances, but while he cracked down on the racket, another racket was getting worse. It's never a pretty sight when crime is more organized than the people who are fighting it. Extortion and corruption had gone through the roof, and while the DA wanted to proceed with prosecution, all our best officers were on noise reduction. So there was hardly anyone left to do detection. The city's citizens seemed to like the silence, but something told me this was the calm before the storm. And when the rain comes down, that hole in our figurative roof is going to cause one nasty leak. As for me, I'd been reassigned so many times I couldn't even tell you what case I was working. Not that it mattered. Our budget was down to a shoestring, and it wasn't even long enough to tie up the loose ends. I never had a chance to follow up on my last major case, a bunch of bridal bloodshed that seemed to lead to a local big shot, BT Dubs. Maybe someday we'll have an extended plot arc, but until then, I was trying to keep my head low and my expectations lower. Since there's no law here against killing time, I decided to slip down to the neighborhood watering hole, the Doddering Mole. Mostly I needed a drink, but there's always a chance someone's making waves in a dive like that. Well, if it isn't detective, you're becoming a regular regular at this point. You on the beat? Nah, I'm just beat. Well, nothing beats a stiff drink. You don't miss a beat, Bart. Let's not beat around the bush. What do you have? Beats me. You know what's in a right Russian? Vodka, beet juice, and bitters. Are things as quiet here as they are in the rest of Noir City? It may be quiet, but there's plenty going on, let me tell you. It ain't easy being behind a bar right now. These new noise ordinances are bad for business, and the Bart Ender is still on the loose. Before long, I'll be the only Bart left in Noir City. I'm so high strung. I'm starting to think it's high time I stopped pouring highballs and high-tailed it out of here. Oh yeah, all those murders. Someone should probably investigate that. What else is on people's minds? Lots of talk about the DA's corruption case lately. I thought that case didn't have a leg to stand on. I've got my ear to the ground. Something's afoot. Sounds like the long arm of the law might have found an eyewitness willing to stick their neck out to get something off their chest. Don't hold your breath. We could be revolutionizing horticulture and reconstructive surgery with all the graft we have in this city. Sorry. I don't mean to be a wet sock. I just know how these things usually go. That reminds me. Someone came in the other day asking about you and sock. Sorry, I have to take this. What's up, Chief? Still blind, just in case you were wondering. Speaking of cases, I have an assignment for you. There's been a murder behind the abandoned sham factory down on Plant Street. Finally. I've been waiting for a real case oh, to- Oh, you're not on the murder case. I assigned that to Detective O'Shea. What? Not Rick! I hate that guy! So what do you want me to do? We're getting calls that they're making a lot of noise at the crime scene. So I need you to ride over and tell Rick to cut the ruckus. Why didn't you just call Rick? I tried, but you're both in my phone as Richard, and I called you by accident. I can't call up everyone I know named Richard hoping I get the right one. It's easier just to send you down there. Chief, I'm not even on duty. Dick, the mayor's been on my back about cracking down on noise violations, and I want to stay on his good side. So get on the ball and get on Rick's case for carrying on. All right, I'm on it. I've got to run, Bart, but it was good catching up. Did you want to hear the potentially pivotal Maybe piece later. of- Maybe later. Gotta go. It's a blow to your pride when you're in homicide and they brush you aside when someone died. But I decided I wasn't going to let it bother me. No doubt the chief had a good reason for putting O'Shea on the case. I mean, I can't single-handedly solve every murder in Noir City. And he probably wanted to give me some downtime after solving a series of stressful slayings last season. So what if O'Shea is a jerk who tries too hard to look cool and one time laughed at me when I crouched down at a crime scene and ripped open the seat of my pants? 
As I pulled up to the back of the factory, I spotted the body, a crime scene tech I'd definitely never met before, and enough police tape to strangle a giraffe. But no sign of Detective O'Shea. Detective Detective! I didn't know you were on this case. I guess my reputation precedes me. Do you recognize me from the newspapers? What? No, we worked together. Is that so? Frank, quietly, I may have worked on every crime you've ever investigated. They certainly keep you techs busy. Where's Detective O'Shea? He's probing the premises for possible perps. What brings you here? Apparently you boys made enough noise to annoy someone. Ah. O'Shea saw a prowler and thought it might be our man, so he fired off a few rounds and ran down that alleyway. O'Shea shot without warning at an unidentified individual who happened to be walking nearby? Yep. Right, like you do. Well, while we're waiting, what have you found so far? Looks like the body has been here two, maybe three days. The victim is one Roland Nolan, a.k.a. Roland the Rat. O'Shea recognized him. He's an informant. Every cop in Noir City knows about Roland. They installed a rotating door at the county prison just for him. He had a drug problem and a getting caught problem, which is not a good combination. He'd do anything to keep from doing time. He would rat out his own grandmother every week for jaywalking. He must have crossed the wrong person who crossed the street the wrong way. Cause of death? We'll need an autopsy to confirm, but we're pretty sure he drowned in his own blood. Oh my god, that is so metal. How did that happen? Well, his tongue is missing. That might have something to do with it. Death by tongue removal. That seems like an impractical way to kill someone. We suspect they were trying to send a message. Mostly on account of the message we found in a plastic baggie stuffed in the victim's mouth. Let me see. Do crop or tongue you take a tongue and tug it taut and cut along the lingual septum until it splits to teach the traitor what he gets love licking bore blah, 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 blah. What's the matter, Dick? Cat got your tongue? I'm not sure that's in good taste, Rick. Well, this guy wouldn't know, would he? Hey-oh. I don't feel comfortable making light of someone's death. Look, the chief just sent me it down here long because night. someone made a noise. With my lame namesake around, it was gonna get even longer. Can't even squeeze in some cynical banter nowadays without some stick in the mud sticking his nose in your business. I'd like to know why Dick Bective was on my crime scene anyway. I had a murder to solve, and this deadbeat was doing his best to murder my mood. This deadbeat wasn't listening to a word I was saying. Hold on a second. Hands in his overcoat pockets, squinting into the middle distance. Is he... He's got an internal monologue going. I'm standing right here, talking to him, and he's narrating. I wonder if I left the stove on. I don't think I did. I lit a cig on the burner, but I'm almost certain I turned it off. God, I could use a cigarette. Maybe that dead guy has a pack on him. He certainly won't be using them anymore. He'll be switching to a different brand of coffin nails. <laughs> I bet he's monologuing about that time I ripped my pants open. The sound of fabric tearing haunts my dreams. I wake up in a cold sweat sometimes, clutching my butt. I'll never live down the nickname, Assless Chap. I should swing by the house before going to the precinct, just to make sure the burner is off. Oh my god, is he still talking? I've got better things to do than listen to assless chap flap his talk box. His body ain't getting any warmer. What are you going on about? If you're here to horn in on my case- No. As I was saying, the chief sent me down here to respond to a noise complaint. I didn't know the force was hiring librarians. Some of us have crimes to investigate, Dewey Decimal. I find this noise nonsense just as noisome as you do, but I have orders. I said what I had to, so let's put it behind us. Since I'm here, maybe I can lend a hand. All right. As long as we're clear who's in charge here. Crystal. No, I'm in charge. Who the heck is Crystal? They hiring dames in homicide now? No, I... Never mind. Give me the rundown. I ID'd the DB as a CI. My CO wants me to establish PC for the DA. The victim is a KA of OC, but the MO has all the markings of an SK. All I know is... I better get OT for this BS. SK? Serial killer. Perp took a trophy, left a cryptic message. The symbolic and highly idiosyncratic nature of the murder suggests pathological tendencies. This has serial killer written all over it. Does the MO match any other murders? None that I know about, but I won't be surprised if another body pops up. That poem the perp pinned seems to imply as much. Right. The message. <clears throat> To crop her tongue, you take a tong and tug it taut and cut along the lingual septum till it splits to teach the traitor what he gets. 
Love licking boots like a doormat. Each tongue I take is tit for tat. That's a mouthful. Unlike this guy's mouth. Hey, hey. Uh, Mind if I take a look at that poem? Go ahead. You sure about the serial killer angle? Seems more like a revenge killing to me. I think those angles are congruent. I bet some jokers had an ace in the hole and aired our perp's dirty linen. And now he's got a laundry list of double dealers he's hanging out to dry. And this guy's the first to fold. Oh, look! The first letters of each line in the poem spell out the word tattle. That's neat. The person who wrote that poem murdered a man and mutilated his body. I know. It, it's just... It's pretty impressive. They must have really worked hard on it. Great. When we bust them, you can ask for their autograph. For now... Wait. Anything else stand out? Yeah. The C in crop is capitalized. The only other letters that are capitalized are the ones at the beginning of each line. To crop her tongue. Why her? Victim is male. And later it says, teach the traitor what he gets. There's as much gender bending in this poem as there is in our casting. Our suspect is leaving breadcrumbs to toy with us. Classic serial killer. What could it mean? Could mean anything. That's the point. It's the kind of clue that's obvious in retrospect, but doesn't give us any leads. Yellow? No, this is Rick. He's right here. Dick, the chief wants to talk to you. What's up, chief? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. I uh, noticed your ringtone. Are you a Starship Mudskipper fan? Oh, yeah, big time. Who's your favorite character? Nikolai, for sure. How about you? I don't know. Probably Mombot. Yeah, I really like the episode where Nikolai reprogrammed Mombot to take over the right. ship. I'll be there ASAP. <sighs> Here you go. I've got a split. Somebody called in a body at the Four Shadows Motel. You should take the tech with you. Are you sure? There's still a lot to do here. I'll take care of it. Besides, Dick Fective needs all the help he can get. That's not my name, Rick... Rick, okay? <laughs> Let's go, Phil. That's not my name. As I drove down Dalton Drive, a depressing drizzle started to fall from the overcast sky. I turned on my windshield wipers, but I still had trouble seeing the road. Too bad they don't make windshield wipers for your eyeballs. I can't believe I said Rick okay. That is so dumb. I gotta think of something better than that. Rick o play? No, that's not an insult. Rick o snay. Well, that doesn't even mean anything. Maybe you shouldn't dwell on it so much. Stop listening to my stream of consciousness. You're just talking out loud, aren't you? Am I? Am I psychic? Focus, Dick. Don't let that stuff distract you. Luckily, someone got murdered. That would take my mind off of Rick for a while. And who did I see when I pulled up to the Four Shadows? Cece Skarsgård. What are you doing here? Detective. I'm the one who found the body. She's right in there. I'll check it out. You knew the victim? Unfortunately. Why do you say that? Besynthony was the kind of friend who makes your enemies jealous. What brought you here today? I came to pay her back. You killed her? I owed her money. Besynthony was my bookie. A detective? I think you better see this. What is it? Rick was right. Same M.O. as the other body. No tongue? And another poem. Read it to me, as quickly as possible. Why quick? Hurry! Oh god, okay. I'll spring a snare to snag the schmuck who spilled his soul and got me stuck in prison cells to save his skin. God spares the solemn man who sins but stinking skunk who snitch on me. Get an ice pick glissectomy. What's a glissectomy? Tongue removal surgery. Oh, right. That makes sense. How does that make sense? One of you has to tell me what's going on here. The murder matches another body we found earlier today. Cece, was Besynthony a stool pigeon who grasped on people to keep from being a yard bird? Not habitually, but a while back the boys in blue booked my bookie for cooking her books and they would have thrown the book at her, so she gave them some names from her little black book and booked it out of there. Great. Guess I just lost this case to Rick. Can you take down the victim's info while I give him a call? Sure thing. Ma'am, can you give me the victim's full name? Besynthony Cropper. You know her date of birth? I know her- Wait! You said the name was Cropper? That's right. Besynthony Cropper. That poem. The one we found on the first body. The first line. 
to crop her tongue. Cropper. Any words capitalized in the new poem? Uh, yes. The S in solemn. God spares the solemn man who sins. Solemn man who sins. Solemn man. Doesn't, doesn't quite fit, does it? It's not wrong, but it's off somehow. Solemn. You, call Rick. Get him down here and up to speed. I've got to go. I... Now! When I jumped into my car, I had no idea where I was going or how much time I had, but I knew I had to get there, and I had to get there fast. I kicked the pedal to the floor and soared toward the fourth ward. The jousting club was closed this time of night, and the St. Simon Saloon has trivia on Tuesdays, so that wasn't likely. I had no idea where he lived, but I knew he had a pad near the docks where he conducted business, so I made for the river. As my car swerved up to the place and I swung out the front door, I heard the sound of glass breaking and footsteps beating a fleet retreat. I took the stairs four at a time and tripped and busted my knee real bad, and then I took the stairs two at a time, but that hurt a lot after knocking my knees. So I just went up the stairs normally, and on the landing I found the door ajar. So I got Gunther out and let him take the lead as I peered into the darkened room. Who's there? Identify yourself. The luckiest felon in Noir City. I breathed a sigh of relief, and then I sucked in some air through my teeth. God, I really banged my knee up. Solomon Sockeye. Someone bludgeoned me from behind, but they bolted when they heard you blundering into the building. It's not often the fuzz has such fortuitous timing. I guess I owe you one. How'd you know? A clue on a corpse, and some handy guesswork. Another dead snitch? You heard about that? If I haven't heard about it, it hasn't happened. But I didn't expect to get dragged into it. If you hadn't shown up, they might be dragging the river from my body, which would be a real drag. We're figuring it's a serial killer, or someone settling scores, or both. Serial killer, huh? Hmm. Did this note mean anything to you? This is what led me here. Looks to me like a load of alliterative lies. You sure it's not someone you helped put away? You and I know good and well that I'm not at the beck and call of the police. I'm a wheeler and dealer, and sure, I've had my ups and downs, but I never did no song and dance for the rank and file. Now, lo and behold, I'm walking on pins and needles, playing a game of cat and mouse, become some so-and-so who mixed up their P's and Q's once me dead and buried. But I'm not sure it's that cut and dry. I don't know the ins and outs, but this may be part and parcel of a bigger conspiracy. And if so... You have to see through the smoke and mirrors and expose the whole kitten caboodle. What are you driving at? I'm not convinced there is a serial killer. Okay, but we're finding an awful lot of dead bodies with their tongues cut out and cryptic notes stuffed in their mouths, so... Oh, there's a killer out there, but you're being fed the serial part of it. What kind of serial killer targets police informants? A revenge killing, that makes sense. But what are the odds we all squealed on the same sucker? Maybe it's a syndicate liquidating their liabilities. I think I'd know if I crossed the mob. Besides, what's with the notes? It's not just your tongue that those notes are twisting. They've got you all turned around. You think the notes are a ruse? I think the murders are a ruse. Sakai, the murders... the murders are the crime. They went to think some wacko is whacking informants, but they slipped up when they iced Roland the Rat. Roland is the best known informant in Noir City. I mean, his nickname is The Rat. Everyone knows they can't trust him, so no one does. Which means he doesn't have any reliable information. Which means no one has ever done time because of him. Which means... No one has any reason to off him. Unless they want the police to know they're knocking off informants. Are you proposing they attempted to perpetrate a triple homicide purely for the purpose of tripping us up? It may seem far-fetched, but I'm trying to throw you a bone. You think I'm barking up the wrong tree. I just want the goon who tried to get me to get got. Until then, I'm going to make myself scarce. But two more things before I go underground. One, if this is a cover-up job and they're using serial murder as a smokescreen, the big picture must be immense. And they won't want people prying, so all these bodies are going to paint a picture that points straight to a patsy. Two, ask yourself who knows about our little arrangement, because you're the only gumshoe I chew the fat with. Aw, really? We have a purely transactional relationship that I capitalize on for my own personal profit. Oh. Okay. I'm leaving now. You won't see me again till this whole stink blows over. (laughs) 
Sakai's sinister insinuations made me question this entire situation. If his hunch was right, someone was taking out informants just so the police would form a misinformed impression. But why? What kind of insidious crime could have stakes so high it makes murder subsidiary? I tried calling Rick to fill him in on what happened, but he didn't answer, so I decided to mosey on over to the morgue and see if Morgan Jordan had made a post-mortem report. I wasn't sure it would lead anywhere, but I didn't know what else to do. Oh, hello, Dick. I wasn't expecting company. How embarrassing. Seems you've caught me elbow deep in this fellow's meat. Could you say it any other way than that? My arms lathered in this cadaver's battered bladder? Ugh. I can almost taste that sentence. Oh, that's probably the formalin I spilled earlier. Don't worry. I mopped most of it up. What do you need? The two tongueless tattletales. Have you examined them yet? Indeed, I have. A shame about their trimmed tongues. Let me know if you find them. I'm always on the lookout for a lovely lingua. I don't want to know why, so I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that. What did you find? Any trace of poison? Drugs? Any possible leads? Both victims died of tongular trauma and lungs full of blood. The male victim has been dead for three days. The female victim died yesterday afternoon. No trace of toxins, but both had non-fatal cranial contusions leading me to conclude they were conked unconscious before their ad hoc amputations. But why do you want to know? I thought Detective O'Shea was running the case. That's a good question, Dr. Jordan. Well, Dick? Just doing my due diligence. I tried to circle back with you, but I couldn't get through. What have you been up to? The second poem made me suspect an associate of mine was in danger. I hurried over just in time to thwart a third murder. Are you sure? Because I just came from the third murder. The body's on its way here now. Who did they kill? Did they get Solomon? Who's Solomon? The victim was a CI by the name of Herbert Brobert. This one's nice and fresh. Herbert Brobert? But... Was there another poem? Of course. And guess what wasn't there? His mouth slug. The limber lump. Can you... The speech spitter. The tonsil tentacle. The throat's red carpet. The old taste word. Rick, I just want to... The stamp dampener. The sloppy slurper. The moist muscle. The oral oyster. What did the poem say? Same nonsense as the other two. What? You think I memorized it? You don't have it on you? What's his name? Uh, that tech is processing the evidence. Do you know where I can find him? Dr. Jordan. Remind Dick whose case we're discussing. Um... I was informed that Detective O'Shea would be covering the case. You hear that, Dick? You need to stay in your lane. I am in my lane. Maybe you should get in my lane if you don't want to miss the exit. What? Solomon suspected the serial killings were simply a setup. For what? Well, he wasn't sure, but... Do you buy what every three-penny thug in Noir City is slinging? I don't know who this Solomon sap is, but he sounds like a crackpot to me. I've got a killer to convict. I can't squander time while you squawk about some con man concocting conspiracy theories. Rick wasn't about to budge. He knew he had a case that would net him some good press and possibly a promotion. And it wouldn't perturb him if a patsy got sent to the pen. If Dick Tective if I can't couldn't follow directives and stop trying to push his defective perspective on my objective... I'm going to unleash a stream of invective on Rick the wouldn't be able to solve a case detective. even if the murderer had tattooed a signed confession on the Dick dead body's butt. Dick is a stupid puppy head who can't even buy pants that fit right. Assless chap. Assless la, chap. La, 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 Assless la, 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 chap. Assless chap. Are you two okay? Why aren't you saying anything? Stop glaring at each other like that. You're creeping me out. And that's saying something. Dick was just about to excuse himself. Well, excuse me. Um... C can I continue with this autopsy? My fingers are starting to prune. Why aren't you wearing gloves? Ugh, fine. I'm going. But think about what I said, Rick. Already forgot it. I knew this was Rick's case. But they'd gone after an associate of mine, and I wasn't going to let something as trivial as protocol get in my way. Besides, Rick kept getting the last laugh. I needed to think of a good comeback. Rick-o-gay? 
That might insult him if we were in sixth grade in 1995. Rick, oh, stay out of my face. God, why is this so hard? Hello? Is anyone there? Hello? Dick, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Oh, <clears throat> hey, I'm here. What's up, Cece? Officially, I'm calling you on the behalf of BT Dubs. He wants me to contact you about a job opportunity. And unofficially? A certain someone slipped me a message. He said you took a detour to visit him down on the waterfront at the Scarlet Street Wharf. I showed up in the narrow margin that prevented an act of violence. He had a shadow of a doubt about our serial killer theory. He told me all about the setup and the killer trying to gaslight you. Unfortunately, we're still in dark waters. The next victim was DOA, another informant. A woman and two men are dead. I know who the third man might be, but you need to know what you're getting into. Take one false step, and then you'll find yourself on dangerous ground. Nobody lives forever. Brute force won't get you anywhere. Promise me you won't get caught in the crossfire. Just give me the goods, angel face. What do you know about the corruption case the DA is spearheading? Seems like Mayor Moray may have more ways to score pay than the law allows for. The man led a double life. Last I heard, the prosecution had unearthed a star witness. That's right. A shyster accountant who got a raw deal was pushed to the breaking point when he saw there was no way out. He made an appeal to squeal on Moray and reveal a deal he tried real hard to conceal. What did Moray steal? Steal. Yes, steal. As in stole. He steals stoles? No, he stole steel. Specifically, he may have given a construction firm preferential treatment for government contracts in exchange for free materials for his real estate developments. And now he wants to silence more than just the streets. But do you really think the mayor would resort to murder? I'm not sure the mayor is calling the shots. Care to guess who owns that construction firm? Who owns anything worth owning in this two-bit city? BT Dubs. Not quite. It's owned by Peter Patterson, paternal uncle of Patty Peterson, the daughter of Duncan Dermond, who is the cousin of Courtney Cassini. But the whole fam damily is part of a network of ghost partnerships, and they're all on the payroll of one BT Dubs. Okay, that's needlessly pedantic. And we both know Dubs will stop at nothing to cover his tracks. Not just murder, but a whole mess of murders meant to muddle any meddlers. Do you know the name of the accountant? The name hasn't been made public, but I happen to know his name is Damon Dawson. So the mayor and Dubs want to rub out this poor schlub to protect their interests. And to deflect suspicion, they've invented a serial killer who snuffs snitches. Very convenient. Do you know where Damon Dawson is? No idea. That could make things tricky. Detective O'Shea is in charge of the case, and he's not buying the cover-up story. But maybe, if I find that poem and the name matches the clue, I may be able to convince the chief to intervene. Where's the poem? Should be in evidence. I'll head that way. Thanks for the call, Cece. Sure thing, Dick. I'll deus your machina any time. Luckily... The evidence locker was just a block away, but I didn't even need to go inside. I found who I needed standing right in front of the entrance. Quink Frightly! Just the man I was looking for. Seriously? Have you already processed the evidence from the third murder? Um, so about that, I swear it was all in a box in my back seat. I don't know what happened to it. What am I going to do? I'll lose my job if Rick finds out. Now's not the time to worry about your livelihood. The poem. Can you remember the poem? Not word for word, but... You know how the other poems had a word capitalized? Was there a part like that? There was. How did it go? It was like, I drained the veins of a dame one day, something like that. The D in dame was capitalized. D 
Dame one. Dame one. Right on the money. I've got to call the chief. Please tell him not to fire me. I'll put in a good word for you, Quank. Oh no. Hello, Rick. It's the chief. I know who it is. I called you. But it's not Rick. I'm Dick. Oh, hello, Dick. Have you solved that missing persons case yet? Oh, right. There was a case I was supposed to be solving. Uh, no, I had a breakthrough on Rick's case. Is that how this works now? Is he solving your case? What? No. I mean, probably not. I don't know. I am confused. Why, if it isn't Dick Detective? I've been looking for you. Just a minute, Dubs. I'm on the phone with the chief. Give the chief my regards. If he doesn't mind holding just a moment, I have a very lucrative business proposition for you. I'm too busy at the moment for a side gig. The missing persons case is not a side gig, Dick. No one has seen the woman for three weeks. Mm, is that so? I was under the impression you had a rather light caseload. I have a missing persons case. That's what I was just saying. I'm sure she'll turn no, up. No, Chief. I called to tell you about Rick's case. It's so urgent. You have enough time to work other detectives' cases, but not enough time to make an easy 25 grand. Hold up. 25 grand? Wait, the no. The kidnappers are asking for 25 grand? What kidnappers? The ones who kidnapped Rick. What on earth this are you- This offer has an expiration date, Dick. And it is fast approaching. I really need to tell you about the case Rick is investigating. Hello? What about What do you say, Mr. Detective? Rick is wrong Easy about the case. Money. We don't have much time. You need to listen. I'm, I'm listening, listening, Dick. Dick. I'll be right there. That was Rick. There's another body. My, my, look at the time. The offer has lapsed, I'm afraid. I'll see you around, Mr. Detective. Dick, what's going on? I thought it was urgent. Uh, sorry, Chief. I bungled it. Where did they find the body? Just around the corner, apparently. Around the corner? Who would murder a witness on the same block as the police station? Do you see Rick? Oh, there he is, by my car. Frank Coitley. Hey, someone remembered my name. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you in what? court of law. What's going on? You thought you'd get away with it. Thought you were real slick. You had no idea I was on to you. Rick, what are you talking about? You are under arrest for the murders of Roland Nolan, the Symphony Cropper, Herbert Brobert, and Damon Dawson. You're joking. This arrest is as serious as cardiac arrest. What's going on, D Dick? Rick, you're way off base. What kind of evidence are you going off of? Oh, I started to suspect early on. Everyone knows the criminal always returns to the scene of the crime, and quietly was spotted at every single crime scene. I'm a crime scene technician. A very handy arrangement. Rick. That's not cause for- and didn't you notice how much he praised the poems the killer left behind? Tooting your own horn a bit, aren't you, Frank? No, 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 I, I just- And then several pieces of evidence mysteriously went missing. Important clues vanished into thin air. And who had access to those materials? I don't know what happened to those. They were in my back seat, I swear. It doesn't make any sense, Rick. What's the motive? Why would he kill those people? I'll admit- that had me stumped for a while. I held off on the arrest because of that, and it cost a man his life. I regret that now. But when I looked into his past, it all became clear. Frank Quietly's parents were killed by a police informant. My parents were killed by a drunk driver. Who happened to be a police informant. Uh, that seems tenuous. Save it for the jury, you mouth-mangling maniac. All the proof I need is in the trunk of your car. I already got a search warrant. Shall we take a look? <gasps> <gasps> Gentlemen, may I introduce you to Damon Dawson, former accountant for Pitter-Patter Construction, the key witness in a major corruption case. And Frank's final victim. Uh, how? The best lawyer in Noir City couldn't spin this one in your favor, Frank. Come on, we're going downtown. Well, we're already downtown. 
but I'm going to take you into that building over there. Frank, don't worry. I know there's been a mistake. I'll figure out what's going on. I'll clear your name. At least you're both getting my name right. Silver lining. Let's go, you tongue-tangling troublemaker. What was going on? This case had gotten more twisted than a titty in a preteen locker room. Dubs, or one of his cronies, must have leaked phony information to Rick to put him on the wrong track. And they stashed the body in the most incriminating place possible. It was no coincidence I bumped into Dubs but a moment before. I needed time to think, to make sense of it all. I decided to head over to the Thin Blue Wine, a joint popular with the law enforcement and sommelier crowds. A drink would calm my nerves and help me think straight. Hello again, Dick. What can I get you? I'll have a pink cow. Red wine and whole milk, I'm on it. I was going to mention, someone came by the St. Simon Saloon while I was tending bar about a week ago. They were making inquiries about you and Solomon Sakai. Whether I've seen the two of you together. Really? Who was it? I can't say. They keep the lights low in there, and he was keeping his brim low as well. But I remember thinking it was odd, because when he first spoke to me, I thought it was you. I thought you were asking me about you. Oh my god. I think I'm having a revelation. How far into the episode are we? Uh, looks like we're a little over 30 minutes in. 30 minutes in? Sudden realization? Are we... Is this... Is this a cliffhanger? Are we going to have a two-episode arc? Oh, shit! To be continued. That was Noir City Blues, Episode 4, The Trail of Tortured Tongues. Written, poetry and all, by Matthew Morris. You heard the voices of Jack Townsend, High Priest Roby, James Lanius, Helen Jacks, Erica Durr, Jeff Quash, Andrew Ferrier, and Helen Schmel. It's Sue! Bless you. Thank you. Need a tissue? No, I had a breakthrough. Rick didn't just arrest the wrong man. He finagled four foul felonies and framed a fall guy to fool his fellow officers, all for the sake of foiling the DA's corruption case. That's horrible. It's wonderful. I've always hated Rick, but now I have such a good reason to hate him. If I can prove he was in on this, they'll put Rick away for a long time. Oh my god. Put Rick away for a long time. That's so good. I don't get it. Because his name is Rick O... You see, he calls me Dick Fective to get under my skin, and I've been trying to think of a good comeback, but... Uh... Never mind. Just trust me. If I drop that line while I slap the cuffs on, mm, I can't wait. But I'll need proof if I want to make the charges stick. You know how to make a case against a corrupt cop? Material evidence, credible testimony, and a clear motive? Thanks, but that sounds a little dry. Call me old-fashioned, but I don't like my cocktails neat. I'm gonna serve this martini dirty. What? A dirty martini is served neat. All I'm saying is Rick is gonna be on the rocks real soon. Once I take my shot, Rick will be so muddled and shaken and strained he'll feel like a zombie. You don't muddle a zombie. Look, Bart, you mix drinks, I mix metaphors. But let's settle up. I've got a score to settle, so it's time to pay my bill and pay Rick a house call. I was already skeptical about the clueless conclusions Rick came to, but I couldn't have guessed he was a conniving cop so corrupt he'd kill to cover up white-collar crimes. Only problem was, I didn't have much to go on, just a hunch about a bunch of half-baked evidence, and a shady figure in a bar asking about another shady figure. But if I could unearth enough evidence to implicate Rick, I could finally pay him back for being such a jerk. Oh, and I'd exonerate a man who was wrongfully imprisoned for crimes he didn't commit. I guess there's that too. But before I did any of that, I needed to keep tabs on Rick and see who he was fraternizing with. And you know what that means. It's time for a stakeout. Is there a perp you need to take out? Make sure there's no reasonable doubt. Better buckle down for a, a stakeout. We need to make sure those charges stick If you want to make that bust real quick You better get 
a steak outside kick. Everybody needs to count some sheep. Steve is here to look out while you sleep. Just try to ignore that he's a creep. So grab chips and dip and Mountain Dew and hunker down for a night or two. See what a sidekick can do for you. It's been a while, Stakeout Steve. I'm so excited to go on a stakeout with you again. You're my favorite stakeout pal. Same, Stakeout Steve. You really know how to liven up a stakeout. There's nothing quite like holding up with some snacks and board games and spying on criminals in the name of justice. Prank calls, pillow fights, eternal vigilance. God, I love stakeouts. I just have to say, I'm so grateful that the city developed this program for peeping toms to complete their community service by working stakeouts. It really helps me feel like I'm using my skills to give back to society and make up for my mistakes. God, stakeout Steve, you know I prefer it when you don't remind me about that part. Let's just take inventory. I've got a feeling this is going to be one long stakeout. You got it, Dick. Let's see here. I've got binoculars and a telephoto lens. I brought my own from home. Hope that's okay. Travel Monopoly, Gun Puncher 2 on Blu-ray, Gummy Worms, Doritos, Pocky, Tostitos, Popcorn, Hot Fries, Sour Straws, Moon Pies, Jerky Sticks, Assorted Cola, Mustard Cheese, and Gorgonzola, Lemon Sours, Candy Bars, Overflowing Cookie Jars. Oh, and I almost forgot. I hope you don't mind that I ordered us our favorite stakeout snack of all time. You don't mean... That's right. Stakeout Steaks! Steaks! Hi, I'm Stacy from Stacy Steaks. Did somebody order a couple of ribeyes for delivery? You ordered from Stacy Steaks? They're the finest steaks in all of Noir City. I aim to please. If you like her steaks, Stacy also bakes, and it's great. That's right. I run the bakery Stacy's Cakes. If you know of anyone looking for a job, let me know. I'm the only employee, and it's literally killing me. <laughs> <laughs> Well done, Stacy. Thank you. No, I mean, these steaks are well done. I ordered mine medium rare. I'm very disappointed right now. Oh! Look alive, Stakeout Steve. We'll need to find some focus if we want to bust this baddie. Oh, are you on a stakeout right now? Yeah. Dick Detective here thinks his co-worker, Detective O'Shea, is a dirty cop and possibly also the serial killer responsible for a recent string of lethal tongue thievery. I wish I could say more, but we're expressly forbidden from speaking about ongoing investigations. That... that was everything. Which place are you staking out? That one right there. The one with the open door? The what? Hmm, that's strange. Aren't doors usually closed when people aren't using them? Something doesn't feel right about this. You two stay here and watch for anything suspicious. But I don't work for you- I'm gonna go check it out. Hello? Anyone there? Rick? Hey, the door was open. You home? Is that... Dick? Rick, where are you? Oh my god! I'm bleeding out, Dick. I'm not long for this world. What happened? Who did this? Did you get shot? No. Well, yeah. I don't want to talk about it. I'll call an ambulance. You hold tight. It's too late, Dick. Come close. I have something I need to tell you. Is he going to confess? Should I get Stakeout Steve in here as a witness? And this may be my only chance to prove that Rick was responsible for all of the- I'm dying, dude. Come here. Right. What did you want to tell me, Rick? Let it all out. Closer. I'm fading. What is it? I just wanted to say, I only have one regret. Tell me, don't bring your secrets to the grave, Rick. I wish... I wish that I had called you assless chap even one more time than I did. God, I'm so cool. <laughs> Son of a... I know what you did, Rick. I know all about it, and I'm going to expose you for what you really are. A dirty cop and a murderer. I'll prove it, and then we'll put you away for... I mean... 
I'll put Rick away for a lo- He's already dead, isn't he? Yep. Well, this complicates things. Hey, Dick. What's going on? You've been gone for a while, so I thought I- Oh, my. <coughs> Looks like I've got to call off the stakeout, stakeout Steve. Rick has been murdered. Oh, man. I was really looking forward to it. Me too. Sorry I barfed all over the dead body. That's not gonna, like, incriminate me, is it? What with my DNA and all? Because I've already got enough legal troubles. It's fine, stakeout Steve. I'll give you a call next time I need to do a stakeout. Sorry it didn't pan out this time. It's okay. See you around. Next time we do a stakeout, I mean, I won't be seeing you without you seeing me, obviously. It's not like I'd spy on you or follow you around or anything. I wouldn't- Please just leave. Hello. This is Dick Detective. I'm at Detective O'Shea's house. He's been murdered. Send a forensics team down ASAP. Some thug plugged Rick and left a slug in his gut. And I wasn't gonna miss his ugly mug, but my gut told me someone was trying to tug the rug out from under anyone pugnacious enough to debunk Rick's serial killer humbug. And like they say, where there's rhyme, there's bound to be a reason. BT Dubs overheard my phone call to the chief about Rick's case. He knew that I knew that something was fishy. And if I reeled Rick in, Dubs reckoned I'd get them all, hook, line, and sinker. So they made sure I found Rick dead in the water. I doubt Dubs pulled the trigger, but I'd bet he paid the guy who hired someone to find a middleman to broker a deal with the hitman who did him in. This put me in a pretty pickle, because now I had to prove that Rick plotted to place a patsy in prison while pursuing the punk who polished him off. But speculation could wait. The crime scene techs were arriving, and one of them looked a lot like someone who I could barely remember. Prank Lightly? Is that you? But how? Easy mistake to make, Detective. I'm Frank's identical twin brother, Ernest. Ernest Lee. You and Frank have different last names? Yes. We're twin half-brothers. Same fathers, different moms. What? But I don't want to bore you with genealogy. Let's talk forensic pathology. Do you have any idea what happened here? I've got a theory, but the details are hazy. When I arrived, the door was ajar, so I stepped inside and found Rick just before he died. He was still conscious? Did he say who shot him? I asked, but he didn't want to tell me. Strange. You said you had a theory? I can't reveal too much. I don't have proof yet. But let me ask you, do you think Frank could have committed those murders? What? What murders? The alleged serial killings. Tongues getting chopped out. Rick arrested Frank for- Frank's been arrested? Yeah, and charged with four counts of premeditated murder. Four murders? Yeah, by now he's probably the most popular prisoner in the pen. They don't take too kindly to law workers on the inside. Probably popular pen prisoner? Sorry, I- I thought you knew. Frank has been, but hi. How- when did this happen? It was- well, now that I think about it, it happened earlier today, like- Five hours ago, maybe? How would I know? No one told me. Sorry, it feels like it's been months. Frank is a serial killer? Does that mean I'm a serial killer? We're identical twin half-brothers. That means I'm 50% likely to also be a serial killer. I, I, don't, I don't think it works that way. This doesn't make any sense. We always had an understanding that if one of us were to turn evil, we'd grow a mustache and a goatee. Tell me, detective, did my brother have a mustache and a goatee? What? A mustache and a goatee, detective, did he have one? Uh, no. No mustache-goatee combo. Then it couldn't have possibly been him. I know that won't hold up in court, and even if it did, beard law is tricky. Look, Frank didn't kill those people. That's my theory. I believe Rick framed Frank for crimes Rick committed, and now Rick has been killed to protect someone else. Why wouldn't you lead with that? I nearly had a panic attack. I, I didn't mean to- You have to go and visit Frank, right now. Well, I am the one in charge of this case. I'd go myself, but some jerk didn't show up for his shift this morning, and now the whole forensic team is behind schedule. Right. Well, I have some questions I'd like to ask him anyway. He worked with Rick on the case, so he might have noticed something I overlooked. Rick could have easily framed anyone in the world he wanted, but he chose my brother. Why? Something doesn't add up here. Okay, I, I usually save that kind of introspection for my internal monologue so I have something to do during the scene segue, so... Time is of the essence, detective. A killer is out there, and not just any killer. A killer who kills killers, and he's already killed one killer! Okay, I'm gonna go visit your brother now. But not because you told me to. Something was bugging me. 
Rick could have easily framed anyone in the world he wanted, but he chose Ernest's brother. Why? Something didn't add up here. Time was of the essence, so I made my way downtown to NCP. That technically stands for Noir County Prison, but it might as well mean National Convention of People Who Hate Me. It's one thing to make enemies. It's another thing to pack them all in one place so they can join forces to plan their revenge. I needed any lead I could get, even if it led me right into the lion's den. But I'd be lying if I started denying my fear of getting pumped full of lead. Luckily, they were all behind bars. But words hurt, y'all. Words hurt. Oh, look who walked in. The one and only assless chap. Dang it! Who told you about that, Dee Dee? Not cool. I'd like to give assless chap a permanent nap if you catch my drift. Saul Slaughter? They've for real put my two worst enemies in a cell together? Oh, that's so messed up. Don't men and women have different wards? What's messed up is your retrograde views on the prison system. We're integrating. Dee Dee, he'd rather drop dead than read an op-ed about co-ed captivity. It ain't just the penal system anymore. There's more clams jammed in the slammer than ever before. Your mother's in here with us, Dick. Would you like to leave a message? I'll see that she gets it. You leave Mama Tective out of this. I thought I told you two lapdogs I didn't want to hear your yapping anymore. It's warm enough in this joint without you windbags blowing hot air everywhere. Frank quietly? But it's Dick Tective. He's the pig that put us in here. You talking out of turn? You must want to savor the flavor of the back of Frank's hand. Sorry, boss. Don't you have work to do? I need those shivs tonight and they ain't gonna carve themselves. Yes, sir. Dee Dee, make sure we aren't bothered. That includes the guards. I have important business to discuss with my friend here. Anything else? Could you get us two glasses of Henri Ford d'Olignon Heritage Cognac Grand Champagne? On it. Two glasses of fancy toilet cognac coming right up. Hey, Dick. Did you just give orders to Saul Slaughter and Dee Dee Dardar? They're both convicted murderers. Yeah, they need a firm hand. Literally, sometimes. But it's good to see you, Dick. Do you have any news? How did I end up here? I still can't make sense of it. Rick framed you. The murders were an elaborate cover-up meant to undermine the DA's corruption case. Rick? A murderer? Can you prove it? I was planning to tail Rick and turn up some dirt on him, but he turned up dead, and now my investigation is turned upside down. But I was hoping you could help turn it around. You worked on the case with Rick. Is there anything odd that stood out? There is one thing. At the first crime scene, Rick shot at a lurker and ran down an alley. That's why I showed up. I was responding to a noise complaint. Thing is, I never saw any lurker. And that got me wondering, who would call in a noise complaint at an abandoned industrial site? No one lives anywhere near there. So you think, what, that Rick called in the complaint himself? But why? When we first showed up at the crime scene, he seemed really annoyed to be there. Like he didn't want to be assigned to the case. He wanted someone else on the case. To show off. That's why he called in a complaint. He wanted to see another detective get fooled by how clever his plan was. That is so Rick. There's a recording of the call in the evidence locker. If it is Rick who made that call, do you think that'll help? I'll be frank with you, whatever your name is. We'll need more than that to get you out of here. But the more suspicious Rick looks, the stronger our case looks. I'll check it out. I went down to NCP hoping for a breakthrough, but I barely got enough info to break even. It's essential to have substantial evidential credentials to make a case consequential, and our clues were looking pretty circumstantial. For now, I'd follow up on every crumb we got, but I'd need to find Rick's killer if I wanted to prove there was a conspiracy. Since I was headed to headquarters already, I took a detour to see if Morgan Jordan had made any headway on Rick's purported murder. Oh, hello, Dick. I was just on my way to lunch. Rummaging around in Rick's ravaged viscera gave me a real craving for rare roast beef and gravy. Mind walking with me on the way to the evidence locker? I have some questions about Rick's death. Did you finish the autopsy? Oh yes. Open and shut, so to speak. Detective O'Shea expired from blood loss caused by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the aorta. Wait. Self-inflicted? That's right. According to the ballistics report, the bullet lodged in his podge was discharged from his own rod. You think it's a suicide? Who shoots himself in the aorta? 
That is so Rick. I ought to clarify. We don't think it's a suicide. It seems to have been an accident. I ruled it death by misadventure. You missed evidence for sure. Couldn't someone use Rick's gun against him? It's cold-blooded, but murderers aren't known for taking the high path ethically. Hypothetically, but analysis from the crime scene suggests that the bullet made contact with another object in the room before making contact with Rick's abdomen. Rick's a bad man, and it sounds like Karma didn't pull any punches. So when he fired his handgun, the bullet bounced off of a surface and back to Detective O'Shea. Correct. Richard O'Shea was killed by his own bullet deflecting off of something. But why was he firing his weapon in his own house? He must have been shooting at someone. I suppose so. There may have been a trespasser, but if so, they seem to have escaped unscathed. A shame. A double autopsy is always a titillating opportunity, or as I like to call it, a menage a raw. Well, here's the evidence locker. Uh... Thanks for filling me in, Dr. Jordan. Happy to help. I spend most of my time emptying people out, so filling them in every now and then is a nice change of pace. And just like that, this investigation was deader than Rick. I'd have asked Morgan Jordan to do an autopsy on it, but I already knew what killed it. No doubt Rick shot in self-defense. But if it was his own bullet that did him in, it wouldn't qualify as a homicide, so his would-be murderer would never be found. I couldn't even prove anyone was there. That left me with a deceased suspect, an incarcerated innocent, and pecunious perpetrators I couldn't possibly punish. And if all that wasn't enough bad news for one monologue, when I went into the evidence locker I found that every scrap of evidence connected to the case had been cleared out. With Rick dead, who could have done it? Was the whole precinct on Dubs' payroll? I had to call the chief. Hello, Rick. I was just going to call you. No, Chief, it's- I got all of that extremely sensitive evidence that you asked for. I left it and all the other BT Dubs related stuff at the burn pile drop-off point, just like you requested. It was a very difficult task to do while blind. You mean- <clears throat> You mean the evidence for the Tongue Tangler case? Is that what we're calling it? I came up with it just now. It has a nice ring to it. Tongue Tangler. I was calling it the Tongue Truncator case. That's not bad. Well, you should get to name it. It is your case, after all. Yes, because I am Rick. And I'm the chief. Anyway, why were you calling? Oh, it was about... about the evidence. Just wanted to make sure you dropped it off like I asked. Can you remind me where the drop-off point is? Oh, Rick. Always asking me how to get to places that you gave me directions to. It's the abandoned lot near the intersection of Sketch Street and Vice Avenue. And why did I want to drop it off there? Sorry, I've just been so busy with the case and not being dead and all that. I understand. It seems like not being dead takes up most of my time. But you didn't mention what you were going to do with it. I just assumed you had a sensible, morally justifiable reason for bringing the evidence there. Thanks, Chief. By the way, if Dick Tective tells you that I committed some heinous crimes, even if he doesn't have much evidence, you should probably believe him. Okay, Rick. Good talking to you. Beep. It took me a while to get down to Vice and Sketch, because I took a wrong turn on Delinquency Drive and ended up on Bad Behavior Boulevard. But I eventually found the spot. Turns out, all I had to do was drive toward the Column of Smoke. There was a barrel fire burning in the abandoned lot, and the man warming his hands by it was either a bum in a bespoke three-piece suit, or BT Dubs. Dubs! I should have known I'd find you here. Are you talking to me? Oh, wait. You aren't Dubs. Nope. The name is Randolph Rutherford. My friends call me Raggedy Randy. What are you doing here? Just warming up. It gets cold nights, and unfortunately I've been homeless for several years. So you really are just a bum in a bespoke three-piece suit? Well, I wouldn't use the term bum. If you're homeless, why are you so well-dressed? I'm a tailor by trade. It's hard to find work cutting custom clothing nowadays, but at least I can make sure I look my best. You're so dapper. 
Why do they call you Raggedy Randy? For irony's sake. Like calling a fat guy slim or a big guy tiny. Huh. Sorry to bother you. I thought you were someone else. Did you mistake that bum for me? Could we stop with the bum thing? Dubs! Whoa, give me a minute. I expected to see you, and then it wasn't you, and now you're here. Oh, it's a lot to process. Hey you, homeless guy. I've got a hundred dollars worth of pennies in the trunk of my limo copter. If you take off your suit and burn it in that barrel, the pennies are yours. Dubs, you really are the absolute worst. You think I'm the worst? He's the guy burning police evidence. What? No! All the evidence from the Tongue Tangler case! I, I didn't know. It was just a barrel full of papers. I, I thought it was trash. Why would a pile of crucial police evidence be in an abandoned lot in the worst part of town? Mmm. I love the smell of immolating highly inflammable criminal evidence in liminal spaces. Am I in trouble? Don't worry, Raggedy Randy. It's not your fault. That evidence would have gone up in smoke with or without you. Okay, I'm gonna leave then. I'm out of my depth here. I'll just take the pennies and go. But here's my card, if you're ever in the market for a hand-tailored suit. Hmm. My suits are made exclusively through the use of child labor. Only the softest hands for these delicate linens. You see? That's why I'm homeless. Can't compete with that. Oh uh, well, off I go. Dubs. I know all about you and Rick and the DA's corruption case. Once Rick had taken care of Damon Dawson, he was just another liability. So you took care of him. As I understand it, Rick died by his own hand. Perhaps inadvertently, but incontestably so. True, an associate of mine may have dropped by to discuss some business, but is it his fault Rick assumed the worst? Rick always was quick to bicker. A lucky break for you. And now you've burned anything that might shed some light on the case. Me? You heard that homeless fellow. He lit the fire himself. I just happened to be passing by. But not all the evidence burned. I found this on the ground. What is it? Oh, just a key piece of evidence linking Rick to the snitch slayings. I see. Since Rick dropped dead, there's no harm in his corpse taking the fall. You're welcome to have it. Just do me a favor. That missing persons case you're in on. Promise me you won't look too hard. The missing persons case? Didn't the chief assign you to- Oh god! Oh, oh, the missing woman! God, I keep forgetting about that. Perfect. Here you are, Dick. Do with it what you will. The paper Dubs handed me was addressed to Herbert Brobert, Rick's third victim. There were just two sentences. I need that poem by the end of the day. The rhymes don't have to be flawless, you just need to include the clue. Was Brobert a poet? Was... was Brobert a... was Brobert a poet? Was this letter written by Rick? I didn't know, but I knew who might. Dick, are you calling for business or pleasure? Officially business. But it's always a pleasure to hear your voice, Cece. Don't try to butter me up, Buster. You know you already owe me. Put it on my tab, then. I need to get in touch with Sockeye. I know he's been laying low since his run-in with Rick but I thought you could reach him. He may risk sticking his neck out since Rick has been nixed. What do you need? Everything he knows about a man named Herbert Brobert. Definitely dead, possibly a poet, and police informant. Ah, Brobert. I'll see what we can do. Meet us at 4.55 p.m. at the new soda counter, Stacy Shakes. Let's skip the transition and get down to business. As long as Sockeye's okay with it. No skin off my back. Welcome to Stacy's Shakes. What can I get you? You'll have to order soon because we close at five and I've got another gig I need to run to. A round of chocolate malts on me, jerk. That's not very nice. Aren't you a soda jerk? Oh, yeah. Sorry. I just have so many businesses, it's hard to keep up. 
so sockeye. Herbert Brobert, Rick's third victim. What can you tell me about him? Really? You never heard of Herbert Brobert? I guess it's no surprise to find out a flatfoot is a Philistine. Should I know the name? He's only the poet laureate of Noir City's underbelly. The Yates of the Ingrates. The Homer of the Homeless. The Rambo of the Rambunctious. I don't understand how the Simpsons and Sylvester Stallone play into all this, but I'll take your word for it. So Brobert was well known in the underworld. Ask any villain in the Noir City cartel to recite a villanelle, and you'll hear a poem Brobert penned in his prison cell. The man made music out of misery. All us rogues and racketeers revered him. But he was a police informant. That's why Rick killed him. How could a rat have such good rep? A man is more than the sum of his failures, Dick. Brobert squealed on a guy once, but his guilt inspired him to write. Elegy for my dignity. A poem that moves me to tears every time I read it. A poem made you cry? Yes. I find Brobert's tenderness for the frail and the fallen profoundly moving. I just assumed you were born without tear ducts, or that you'd had them surgically removed. I actually lost them in a horrific mascara application accident. I had to get implants. Mascara app. Three chocolate malts! Need anything else before I go? Nope. Thanks, Stacy. Why the sudden interest in Brobert? I need proof that Rick was the killer. Here's a letter to Brobert. I suspect Rick wrote it. So you finally figured out that Rick wasn't harboring hidden poetic potential. I knew Brobert's handiwork the moment I heard the poems. The rigid formal structure, the dense use of alliteration and consonants. Unmistakable. So Rick had Brobert write the poems that he left in his victims' mouths. And when Rick botched the bludgeoning of Sockeye... He needed a new third victim. So he killed his own accomplice. And silenced a possible witness in the process. Which means the poem planted in Brobert's murdered mouth... Was written by his own hand. Which is why I think Brobert didn't realize what the poems were for. But something must have tipped him off at the last minute, just before he died. We swung by Brobert's apartment for a little B and E. And we discovered this stash in Brobert's secret safe. A confessional haiku. <clears throat> Which is mightier? Rick swung my pen like a sword, blood spilling like ink. That's really poetic and all, but I'm not sure it qualifies as irrefutable evidence. You also left a signed affidavit testifying to his inadvertent involvement in the crimes and his suspicions regarding his own impending death. Oh, great. Yeah, that's pretty airtight. I'll call the chief. Hello, Dick. Or whoever might be calling me, this is my voicemail. If you would like to leave a message, please... Went straight to voicemail. Let me call the precinct real quick. Should we tell him about... No. We shouldn't get mixed up in that. He'll have to figure it out on his own. Okay. I'll head over there. Thanks. The chief is at a funeral. I'm going over there now. Would you two tag along to back me up? Normally, no. But for Brobert, just this once. Let's go, Dick. This was it. I finally had what I needed to take Rick down. I mean, he was already dead. But six feet down wasn't low enough for me. I was going to right whatever wrongs I could. And if I got to drag Rick's memory through the mud, that was just the cherry on top. True. Dubs would get away scot-free, but what can you do? Money is a universal lube, and Dubs had enough to slip through any crack that came his way. But Dubs would get his dues one day. For now, I had a funeral to crash. Welcome to Stacy's Wakes, where... Oh, it's y'all again. The ceremony already started, but if you want to... No time to listen to words. The chief is in there, and I need to talk to him. Stat! But Dick, this funeral is... Was so sweet and kind hearted to his dear old. Excuse me, lady, I'm gonna need that mic. Police business. Chief, you here? I've got vital news about the tongue tangler case. I'm right here, Dick, and not at all bothered by you crashing this funeral. What did you find out? I have indisputable proof that Rick committed the four gruesome grisly murders that shocked Noir City. Oh. <gasps> ah. Really? Yes, Morgan Jordan. With cold-hearted callousness, he killed Roland Nolan, Bethany Cropper, Herbert Brovert, and Damon Dawson. 
chopped out their tongues and left pretentious poems in their mouths that he didn't even bother writing himself. Oh, oh no. I feel faint. Do you have proof? Oh, hey, Ernest. His third victim, Herbert Brovert, wrote the poems, including the poem that ended up where his tongue ought to be. In this affidavit, conveniently created just before his horrifying murder, he testifies to how Rick commissioned the poems without revealing their pernicious purpose. Only at the very end did Robert realize his fatal mistake. C.C. Skarsgård and Solomon Saka, can I get an amen? Amen? That doesn't feel like the appropriate response. I, uh, I need to, I need to sit down. Sorry, I got carried away. I can't believe this is happening. Who on earth is this woman? She keeps stealing my thunder. I'm Rick's mother. Why are you at this funeral? Dick, that's what I was trying to tell you before you rushed in. This is Rick's funeral. What? Already? That is some fast turnaround. And to think, I was talking to Rick on the phone two hours ago about not being dead. You just never know. That's our motto. Call Stacy's Wakes if you don't like how long it usually takes. How do we know Brobert is telling the truth? Do we have any evidence connecting him to Rick? This letter, a handwriting comparison and some fingerprinting should prove that Rick wrote it. Let's take care of that right now. Hmm, <laughs> where are my pruning shears? Ah, here they are. Oh, God. oh my. <laughs> here are his fingertips, Ernest. Can you do a quick fingerprinting test? We could have just left the fingers on the body. But based on this newly invented and highly implausible instant fingerprint test I happen to have with me, it's a match. But why? Why would Rick do such a horrible thing? Because, wait, Stakeout Steve? What are you doing here? Look, I've been on stakeouts with other detectives. I've got a ton of community service hours I need to work off. But believe me, you and I have something special. Our stakeouts are the best. Aw, I feel the same way, Stakeout Steve. But why would Rick kill all those people? What the heck? Raggedy Randy? You knew the deceased? Oh, no. I was just getting into the spirit of the moment. But why are you here? I go to funerals for the free food. Usually I have on a three-piece suit so people don't question my presence. I'm realizing that I'm way more conspicuous in my underwear. Man, everyone is here. Bart, you mixing drinks? You want one? Could I get a corpse reviver? No. Not at a funeral. Never again. Not after... last time. Do you know how to make an epic climax? One part bitters, one part sweets, one part symphonies. Thank you for proving my innocence, Dick! Frank? And Dee Dee? And Sol? Hey. Hey? Why aren't y'all in prison? Oh, you know. Loopholes. <laughs> oh, my baby boy. <laughs> oh, I miss him so much. Oh. But Dick, you never said why Rick committed these atrocities. I'll tell you, Ernest. I'm Frank. I'm Ernest. We really need to hire more actors. It's not in the budget, Dick. There's a budget? No. Could you explain why Rick performed such unspeakable acts of depravity? I didn't know him, but... You've got me invested now. I believe that Rick was a dirty cop who framed Frank as a serial killer to cover up the motive behind the murder of Damon Dawson, who would have taken the stand in the DA's corruption case. So Rick wasn't just an unrepentant murderer like me? He was also a corrupt cop? Disgusting. <laughs> it can't be true! Rick was definitely dirty, no doubt about it. Wait, you knew? Why weren't you keeping tabs on him? <laughs> I can't keep tabs on every dirty cop. You know what they say, you can't make an omelet without having all your bad eggs in one basket. Do you have any evidence that can prove Rick was an accessory to a conspiracy? BT dubs, you know good and well that all the necessary evidence has mysteriously vanished under suspect circumstances. Are we talking about all that police evidence I accidentally burned? Because, again, there's no way I could have known. The good news is, I have enough evidence to permanently tarnish Rick's reputation. No, not my Rick. And exonerate me. That too. Hooray. Well, what about me? Dee, you weren't framed. You did the murder. Fiddlesticks.
Well, it was worth a try. Excuse me, this is all quite exciting, but I get the feeling the funeral is coming to an unexpected end, and I have a statement the deceased left in his will that I am legally obligated to read to those attending his funeral. Are you done with the dramatic revelations? Oh, I guess so. Man, that was exhilarating. I should break all my cases wide open in front of a live audience. Okay, here's the statement Rick left. Ahem. Is Dick Fective at my funeral, trying to prove I committed some crime? I'm dead now, so it doesn't really matter. He's probably right, I've done tons of crimes. But my last request is for everyone at my funeral to call him Assless Chap. Oh, oh my! Gasp. What? Assless Chap. Assless Chap. Assless Chap. <laughs> no! Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. Nothing personal, Dick. Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. Frank, really? I just proved your innocence. Sorry, Dick. It's a dead man's final wish. He killed so many people and blamed you for it. Assless chap. Assless chap. Assless chap. <laughs> That's my boy. God, I hate Rick. That was part two of Noir City Blues, Tying Up the Trail of Tortured Tongues. It was written by Matthew Morris and Jack Townsend, and the voices you heard belonged to Jack Townsend, High Priest Roby, Jeff Quash, Helen Schmel, Helen Jacks, Erica Durr, Killian Gilbo, James Lanius, Matt Stanley, Andrew Ferrier, and Matthew Morris. Asthma attack halfway through that one. All right. Um, First for the chief. Gasp. And then for other random bystanders. (gasps) Oh. Oh. Huh? Oh. 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 It's your turn. I I broke my epiglottis. Oh my god. (laughs) Another bleak night in Noir City. The sun sets, and the alleys lengthen with the shadows, like ink spilling across a map. If you don't know Noir City, it's a hard town. Faces are hard, the liquor is hard, and the water is very hard. The only easy thing about Noir City is giving directions. No matter where you're standing or which way you're facing, Noir City is behind you, right behind you, and getting closer. In a town like that, the worst sound of all is quiet. And tonight, it's quiet. All quiet but the sound of my typewriter, like the devil cracking his knuckles. It's from the depths of that dark quietude that I write to you. That's not a good way to start a letter. Um, to my dear and fondly remembered, gross, to whom it may concern. Oh God, why is this so hard? Uh, hey chief. I wonder if you remember me. The name's Tective, Duck Tective. Sorry, autocorrect. The name's Dick Tective. You've probably worked with a hundred guys with my name since we saw each other, but I'm the one who left for Noir City. I thought of you a lot this week, although I'm not sure you always would have been proud of me. My biggest rival on the force, a walking, talking HR complaint named Detective Richard O'Shea, had turned out to be a mole for Noir City's biggest kingpins, doing their bidding behind the badge for years. In this town, our municipal principles are anything but invincible. But Rick set a new low. He murdered a key suspect in a corruption case, covered up the murder with a bunch of other murders, and covered those up by pointing the evidence towards a fall guy. And what poor pawn did he pick to play pin the pain on the patsy? One of NCPD's own crime techs, the most good-hearted kid in the department. 
In Rick's twisted world, no one looked guiltier than someone who wanted to do the right thing. Justice eventually caught up with Rick, but poetic justice beat us to the punch. Turned out that the baddies Rick worked for shared his fondness for Fall Guys. And once he'd played his part, they arranged for him to get hit with his own bullet. Which left the rest of us in the department with a Pyrrhic victory and a lot of mess to clean up. They say the winners write the history books, but the way things go in Noir City, we just say the survivors write the epitaphs. As for me, I drew the short straw and got stuck emptying out Rick's office. Rick had a lot of stuff. Too much stuff to be explained by a detective's paltry salary. Up close, this stuff had police corruption written all over it. Or to be precise, written all over the thank you cards that in many cases were still attached. I could almost hear him laughing while I shoveled through half-emptied bottles of champagne, heaps of pocket watches and cufflinks, and crystal ashtrays in every conceivable color. Maybe it's true you can't take it with you, but it sure looked like he'd enjoyed it while it lasted. My orders were to lug all the loot straight to the dumpster, but I'm not gonna lie. Part of me wanted to rebel and swipe something swell to sell on the DL. Rick's case had worn me out, and I needed a vacation. I'd read about a getaway on the edge of town called Stacy's Lakes. Looked like a place I could forget my troubles for a while. But without some supplemental income, I wouldn't be able to afford the ink on the reservation. In the end, I did what I was told and trashed all the treasure. But I let myself keep one thing. On Rick's desk between the Martini Matic machine and the three-pack of self-tying ties, I found a little music box. No note. No hint where it came from or what it meant. Just a clue to a mystery that would never be solved. Who had Rick been? Or who had he hoped to be before Noir City got to him? Normally I wouldn't lose sleep over a bad guy's origin story, but this one hit close to home. To take Rick down, I'd had to make a deal with the devil. The devil in question? B.T. Dubs. This town's very own man behind the curtain. Dubs had come to me offering evidence that would prove Rick's guilt and get our innocent tech out of prison. But in exchange, Dubs had wanted a promise that I would look away from another case on my docket. A woman was missing. A nameless, faceless stranger in need. The kind of person I'd joined the force to help all those long years ago. But Dubs wanted her to stay missing. And in the end, I'd signed in blood on the dotted line. All in all, just a regular day in this town. In Noir City, if you want to believe in something, you've got to run as fast as you can just to stay where you are. And eventually, falling is going to sound real nice. Now I couldn't help but wonder if this was what it looked like when Rick first stumbled. So after I finished sanding cigarette burns and dried smears of caviar off Rick's desk, I went back to my office to see if I could resurrect the case Dubs thought was dead and buried. With the evidence in front of me, it was clear why the case was so forgettable. The file was thinner than a cockroach and just as likely to slip through the cracks. Which left me with nothing but questions. Why did Dubs care about it? How long could I live with myself if I tucked it back out of sight? And how long could I live, period, if I decided to break my word to Dubs? Someone out there knew the answers. I kept thinking back to something I'd overheard from Cece Skarsgård and Solomon Sakai a couple of my underworld associates. We'd been working together to bring down Rick, and I stepped away to take a call when the two of them conferred. Should we tell him about- No, we shouldn't get mixed up in that. He'll have to figure it out on his own. I could totally hear them. I was just a few feet away and they weren't especially quiet. But I don't know. It had seemed rude to ask about it. So now I was stuck knowing that I was a step behind. More than a step. The woman had been missing for weeks. A cold case is like cold pizza. Some people love it, and then there are people who are sane and rational like me. And if I broke my promise, followed this trail, and risked my neck just to find a dead woman at the end, that was gonna be one cold, soggy anchovy with pineapple. Anyway, I was at my neighborhood watering hole, the rising action, spilling all this angst on my bartender, Bart. Bart normally sees me in high spirits. When I finish a case, I like to celebrate by finishing a case of tequila. Tonight, though, the only party I wanted was a pity party. But Bart wouldn't bite. Hmm, you know, that crime scene tech you were talking about, Flank Tightly or whatever he's called, I read a newspaper story today about him. One day he's living his life and doing his job, and the next day, smack, he goes to prison for murder. 
I thought, how about that? Life can pull you down in a hot second. And then today, what do I read in the paper? They found out a whole bunch of people had got wrongly imprisoned and they set them all free. How about that? Life can pull you back up in a hot second. I gotta say, Bart, as tributes to the value of the justice system go, that story is pretty depressing. Dick, there's what you need and there's what I got. And you know what I got from those stories? I gotta be ready for anything. I sympathize with you, how you're feeling, but I can't afford to lose my mojo like that. Did you notice, while you were talking, I made drinks for 71 people? In my line of work, you slow down, you fall down. If I don't like it, I gotta change it. Recently, I heard someone talking about something called passive income, and I got to thinking, I need to invent something. So I spent a week, or maybe it was a month or a year or something. But anyway, I stayed up late after work every night, trying out drink formulas until I passed out. But one day I woke up and I saw a recipe on a notepad. I invented an energy drink. I'm calling it Release the Beast. Now I'm selling it on the side and I think it's gonna turn things around for me. So listen, what I'm trying to say is, if you wanna turn things around for yourself, you should try selling my drink, Release the Beast. You could buy a few cases at a bulk rate, and if you bring in other salesmen, there are prizes. No thanks, Bart. Happy for you and all, but your drink sounds like an upper, and everyone knows I've got an exclusivity agreement with Team Downer. Can't blame me for trying. My point is, you want things to change. You gotta hustle for it. So detectives don't get paid much. What if you wrote down your best cases, got some actors to perform? There's no money in that. No, Bart. All a detective can sell is out. Got it. Well, sorry, you're doomed. What's up, Chief? Dick, any word on the missing woman case? I'm seriously on the verge of just about ready to get started on it. No new leads? There remains but the one fact. She was reported missing by the hotel where she was staying. She checked in, was never seen again, and didn't pay her bill. Didn't they give us a name? It wasn't that kind of hotel. This was one of those hush-hush places. You know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. I see. She was a crime tourist. Crime tourism was the name on the street for what was officially called Project Hush Wink Nudge. It was a revenue enhancement program out of City Hall. Anyone who says crime doesn't pay has never attended a meeting of the Noir City Convention and Visitors Bureau. Under the NCCVB, Noir City had gone from having a reputation to having a brand. Thanks to their lobbying, visitors to Noir City had gotten immunity to commit low-level crimes. The kind of crimes a mid-tier office worker is sure to start fantasizing about as red tape slowly strangles their life. The launch of Project Hush Wink Nudge brought an instant tidal wave of tourism and demand for seedy, anonymous hotels exploded overnight. Now, the business community is happy. City Hall rakes it in. And the people of Noir City, they just get mugged for a change. Everyone wins. Once in a while, a tourist gets a little big for their britches and causes some real trouble. But the masterminds in the NCCVB addressed that with some gamification. They added a system of panache points for crimes executed with style. Tourists who racked up the points could go home with prizes, like a commemorative scar, one of those cool ones that goes across your eye. But to earn points, the tourists have to register with us at NCPD. That way, if things go off the rails, we can track them down, maybe even to a hotel that never asked for their name. All right, so step one, we send a tech down to dust for fingerprints and we check the tourist database for a match. That was done the day the crime was reported. They found prints, but no match in the tourist database or anywhere else. Huh, so she wasn't on record. Had we slipped up and never registered her? Had she been snatched up just as she arrived in town? Why would anyone in Noir City want to kidnap her? Questions loomed, and the one bit of truth was a bitter one. If I was going to risk my high for this woman, it was because deep down, I wanted something from her. I wanted her to be that perfect innocent I'd joined the force to rescue, and I wanted her to prove that I was still the guy who built his life on that mission all those years ago. Anywhere else that dream might stand a chance, but this was Noir City, and odds were she was just one more opportunist, caught in a trap of her own making.
Dick, I didn't catch that. It sounded like you said, a ding ding, dum dum dum, dee dal, dee dal dum. Sorry, Chief, I was just thinking. Well, think fast. I've got a second case for you, and I'm going to need you to do them both double time. What the heck, Chief? You can't keep working me like this. I've been at it so hard I've been dotting my T's and crossing my I's. Now's not the time to start slacking off. Maybe you've heard, there's been a mass release from the prison. They're saying these folks weren't in the prison's records, so releasing them was a no-brainer. But just in case, we need to get ready for a bumpy few days. Plus, departmental policy says it's best for a detective to be on multiple cases at the same time, since things always turn out to be connected. All right, fine. Lay it on me. A painting has been stolen from the goo Gallery down on Drivel Drive. See if you can't tie a bow on this one before we're all up to our eyes in new cases. All right. I'm right around the corner. I'll walk over there. So I left the bar with my hands full, and not just with too many cases to solve. I also left carrying one of Bart's energy drinks, which I bought just to get him to leave me alone. It came in a featureless can with Release the Beast written across it in marker. I opened it, and it smelled like cold pizza. It felt good to be back on the street, but the chief was right. After this prison release, the public was about to hit anyone wearing a badge with a heap of questions. Had we been locking up innocent people? Had we let a bunch of crime tourists go unregistered? Had we been tricked into releasing hardened criminals? Or were we using the prison as a daycare again? Once more, I heard those voices. Should we tell him about... No, we shouldn't get mixed up in that. He'll have to figure it out on his own. One thing was for sure. This mass breakout was going to cause a mass freakout. It was just a question of when. I went online to get the public's temperature. Noir. City. Pris... Yep, first result. Hi, I'm Stacy, and welcome to Stacy's Takes, where we review the latest controversial Noir City news. What should we think about today's massive prison release? Well, on the one hand, the Noir City penal system is brutal and does nothing to reform wrongdoers. So freeing people from that horror show is the right thing to do. On the other hand, the Noir City penal system is brutal and does nothing to reform wrongdoers. So the idea of just releasing prison-hardened criminals onto the streets leaves me, frankly, terrified. Honestly, I don't know what to think. It's like I've got two minds. By the way, don't think that I'm whining, but there's no whining and dining behind all this opining. So if you're interested in sponsoring Stacy's Takes, we sure won't be declining. Suddenly, I sensed movement ahead of me at the other end of the little dark alley I'd found my way into. Crud. Hello there, little kitty. Are you lost? Dee Dee Dardar? You're out of prison? As you can see, or you could if you hadn't been staring at your phone. Hasn't anyone ever taught you no screen time after sunset? Your eyes won't be adjusted to the dark. You might fall on something sharp. Dee Dee and I had history, complicated history. She was an artist, oils, ceramics, and cons. But she tided her career over with a day job of extortion and murder. I'd caught her in the act and put her behind bars, but it looked like her sentence had lasted about as long as our sort of kind of relationship, which went south when she poisoned me midway through our first date. And Dee Dee was the furthest thing from a crime tourist. If she was out on the street, something serious was going on. Funny I should run into you so close to the Google Gallery. Me and uh, the rest of the department's intramural jujitsu team are investigating an art theft. Am I about to find your fingerprints all over this case? Oh no. Prison has reformed me completely. I'm a whole new woman. Sometimes. Then it hit me. Dee Dee was one of the identical daughters of BT Dubs. Had he pulled the strings that had opened all those cell doors? And if so, was it all for the purpose of sicking Dee Dee on my trail? Did he somehow know that I was thinking about breaking our deal? So, all that talk about the released people being wrongly imprisoned was just a cover story. What did your paw want in exchange for springing you loose? Dear old daddy dubs, is he the reason I'm with you in the intimate privacy of this alley? Remind me to send him a fruit basket. 
No, if he wants your skin, he'll have to settle for my sloppy seconds. Come to think of it, I can't be the first to stumble into you. You had quite the fan club back at Noir County Prison. The others will be waiting in the shadows, working up the courage to ask for your autograph. Happy to give it to them on their arrest papers. I may not be the dog catcher, but I'm not above sending a few strays back to the pound. Oh, Dick, what part of mass release don't you understand? They knocked the lock off the gates of heck today. It's going to be an onslaught. Are you nervous? My eyes were starting to adjust. She was sauntering my way, one hand behind her back. And then she froze. Her eyes went wide, and she made a sound like a death rattle. She was so close I could feel her breath on my skin as she whispered, Do I smell... cold pizza? No doubt about it. Her eyes went down to the can in my hand. This? Uh, yeah, I guess. Do, do you want it? Yes, I do. But I have a very... serious... allergy. And she was gone. So that didn't go great. I'd stumbled right into a trap, gotten saved by dumb luck, and in the meantime, I'd barely gotten a clue out of her about the jailbreak and the stolen painting. I just took her word for it and let her walk away. Who does that? Next time I see her, it'll be on a poster that says, Most Wanted. That makes two of us, poster. That makes two of us. I took the constructive criticism and covered the last of the distance to the Gugal Gallery on high alert, keeping to the deepest shadows. But of course I'd just said where I was going for anyone to hear, and I could feel eyes on me as I walked up to the brightly lit front doors. Inside, a short hallway gave way to the main room, a cavern of space with too much light and too many columns. And somewhere in the vastness, a missing painting. Time was ticking, but the talked-up tech was already there, tucking into the evidence. In our line of work, it wasn't often you found someone you could count on, and what with the high risks and the short lives, I make it a point not to get attached. But I was starting to feel like this guy was someone I could- Whoa! Oh, Dick. Oh, you scared me. Sorry, uh- It's fine. I'll just- Whew. <laughs> I gave him his space, and while he caught his breath, I did the friendly thing and pulled up a news story about his arrest on my phone, just to make sure I got his name right. Good to see you again. Frank, quietly. Closer than ever, detective. Sorry, they spelled it wrong on your mugshot. Oh, don't I know it. Since you got me out of prison, I've been asked to autograph that thing more times than I can count. Never realized how much glamour I was missing out by solving crimes instead of committing them. Hey, speaking of autocorrect, is your nameplate supposed to say duck detective? Wait, seriously? I just got... <sighs> Have people been seeing this all week and no one's told me? Should we tell him about... No. We shouldn't get mixed up in that. He'll have to figure it out on his own. Never mind. We should keep this quick, Frank. Word on the street is that some criminals might be lurking around here with an eye on yours truly. What have you found? Evidence. The theft was of a single painting here in the main gallery. Nothing else missing, no forced entry, the alarms never even went off. I'm guessing our thief got in the way everyone gets in. Bought a ticket, supported the arts, and cased the joint during business hours. Then they hid, shut off the power at the breaker box, and waltzed home with their painting of choice. Whoever it was, they seemed to have wanted to do a minimum of damage to the building. Attention to style. Crime tourist maximizing points? I don't think so. See all those ceramic pots over there? A crime tourist would usually break those in the hopes that there were small sums of money or restorative consumables inside. This scene is almost respectful. And there's one thing I'm especially impressed with. Can you guess what it is? Uh... Something I don't think I've seen on any crime scene we've worked on. Uh... Okay, I'll tell you. There's no body. Whoever did this pulled it off without killing anyone. I'm kind of proud of them. Oh, sure. Yeah, I felt like something was missing. Wow. Just theft. Picture Dr. Morgan Jordan at the morgue right now. He's probably tapping his foot or maybe someone else's foot just waiting for a body to autopsy. Soon he'll be going around the department asking for volunteers. It is quite the novelty, but if you recall, there's a good chance we're surrounded outside this building by vengeful escaped prisoners. So let's just make sure it isn't us that Dr. Morgan Jordan ends up autopsying. Sure thing. Sorry. One last bit of evidence. The thief left what appears to be a signature. 
See that twisty shape in the dust on the wall where the painting used to hang? Oh, looks kind of like a yin-yang. Whatever it is, it doesn't help us much. The symbol doesn't appear anywhere in our signature database. A signature with no record. A missing woman with no record. A bunch of released prisoners with no record. Exciting new faces on the Noir City criminal scene. Okay, for real, Frank, you're freaking me out. What's with all the enthusiasm? I would have expected you to come out of prison, I don't know, shell-shocked? But, wait, do you think this was someone you met at NCP? One of the people who got released? No, this wasn't someone who got released today. This took time. I just... Being in prison and hearing about people's past work gave me a new appreciation for the craft, and I just think this is a standout crime. But I hear you. We do not want to be in public longer than we can help. Come on, let's go. I've got everything I need. I turned to go, leaving the massive gallery for the narrow hallway that led to the exit. Frank picked up his things and ran to catch up. And then, right behind me, I heard his footsteps stop. What is it? Did you hear something? I turned to look. It was only an instant before something inside Frank broke and he ran past me out of the building. But in that instant, I saw him frozen. His eyes stuck to the open can of Release the Beast in my hand. I knew I needed to follow him, but in the time it took that thought to get from my head to my feet, the bomb went off. I don't know why I survived the collapse of the museum. Maybe it was luck? Or maybe Noir City just wasn't done with me yet. Either way, I found myself lying on my back in a hallway with no building attached to it. Just a pile of rubble at one end and a pair of doors at the other, blown wide by the same wave of shock that had knocked me down. I picked myself up and got out of there. Out on the street, I could see that the bomb had knocked out half of the main gallery. I could only hope Frank was in better shape than the crime scene was. I needed to figure out where he'd gone, and fast. If someone wanted me dead, it wouldn't be long before they realized I'd dodged a bullet. Then, from the ruins, I heard a clang. The twisted remains of ventilation duct were poking from the wreckage like a severed blood vessel. It gave a lurch, and out crawled Solomon Sockeye. Solomon was one of my numerous nemeses. Wriggling free was his specialty, and he dodged the department more times than I care to admit. But as thieves and scoundrels went, the man lived by a code and once in a while he decided to point me in the right direction. And sure, our congeniality was all about criminality, which just proved the reality of the malady of venality we have in this municipality. But in a place where all relationships are transactional, a little warmth goes a long way. Sockeye, what brings you here? Stolen any paintings lately? Is this what passes for detective work in your department? Remind me to introduce you to my friends, causation and correlation. They're twins. We can tell them apart if you try. No, I'm here for something much more interesting. Something not meant for the likes of you. Unless... Suddenly, Solomon gave me a look I'd never seen before, like I was a $20 bill he'd found on the ground. Is it you I'm supposed to be meeting? Are you looking to change sides? I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm just leaving. I've got to go check on Frank. Frank Quietly? He's the one who asked me here. Quite the surprise that he knew the magic words, but I'm told prison can be awfully enlightening. Frank asked you here? To do what? What part of not for the likes of you didn't you... You know what? What the heck? I'm gonna need you anyway. Someone's gotta describe the crime scene now that it's destroyed. Describe the crime scene? I'm here in my capacity as a board member with the Better Burglary Bureau. Get your jaw off the floor, detective. You law enforcement types didn't invent bureaucracy. I've even got a badge. Sure, okay. So how do you make burglars better? We offer trainings, certifications, etc. There's a lot of sub rows of quid pro quo in this town, and everyone knows caveat emptor. So if you're a persona non grata and then ipso facto, you need a way to show your bona fides. I understood maybe two letters of that. Mea culpa. Look, trust is at least as important in the underworld as it is up here. So we offer credentials you can use to let your fellow felon know you mean business. We've got everything from Doctor of Danger and Master of Menace all the way down to Bachelor of Bigness and Badness. You earn those titles by taking an exam. And if someone says the magic words, I show up to play Proctor. And so you're here to examine... A work sample. One crime. Rated on a point system disclosed neither to the test taker nor to overly curious bystanders. 
And before you ask, no, in fact, the crime tourism people got the idea from us. So you rate this art theft for who? Who did it? Your guess is as good as mine. But there's a type. The typical test taker is someone who's already got a skill, but needs help proving it. Because... Because they're new in town. Whoever did this is new to Noir City. That's why the signature didn't turn up any matches. A signature, huh? The examination begins. Now we just wait for our... <coughs> Hi there. Did that get in your eyes? Sorry, mate. What am I like? I'm thinking if you appear in a burst of smoke, best do it up close so they get a good view. I'll know better next time. Who are you? The name's Sutton. All of us Sutton. I'm a dashing gentleman thief and I'm here to make a name for myself in this town. The smoke finally cleared enough for me to get a good look. In front of us was a man I'd never seen before, with a glint in his eye and a mustache and goatee on his face. He looked guilty and proud of it. So did you steal the painting, or blow up the building? Or both? Blow up? Never! I went to great lengths not to blow it up, all part of the plan. As for the painting, your question brings up an interesting philosophical framework. If someone takes a painting out of a museum that's about to explode, is he a thief or is he more like Oklahoma Jones or whatever? But yeah, I took it. Here you go. Whoa, how'd you do that? Easy. It's flat. You just turn it sideways. You're clearly not the larceny expert in the room. So by process of elimination, that means you are Solomon Sockeye. The same. I'm sorry. I'm trying to place your accent. Where in the Commonwealth are you from? The whole thing. All right. So if you're Sockeye, the other one... Hey, it's you. I've heard of you. Duck, detective. No, that's not my name. They just printed my nameplate wrong. I mean, Duck. He didn't have to tell me thrice. I got to the ground where it turned out Solomon already was, just in time to feel a large chunk of rubble whiz over my head. I rolled over and caught a glimpse of a snarling lurker in the ruins. I didn't know him, but it was clear he knew me. Detective? More like dictator. Die! The guy threw another rock. It wasn't hard to dodge, but he had a lot more where that one came from. And if it came to a fight, I couldn't say whether it was him or me who'd be facing three-on-one odds. But Oliver spoke up. Oi, I know you. You're Bommy Tommy. What's the matter with you? Fresh out of prison, new lease on life, a chance to see your spouse and kids, and you're faffing about throwing things at people? Get your priorities straight, bub. Oliver? Sure, you're right. It's true what they say. Revenge is a dish best served for dessert. But rest assured, detective, you haven't seen the last of Bommy Tommy. And when you see me again, you'll never see me cut. Hey, is that? <sighs> ah, gimme! The rapscallion sprinted my way, and this time I didn't have to look to know where his eyes were. By now the can was crushed and nearly empty, but still there. It takes a lot more than a few falls and crumbling building to pry open a detective's gun hand, but a wide-eyed salivating convict running straight at me felt like a pretty good justification. I wound up and chucked the can deep in the ruins, and the guy did a 180 and bounded after it like a strung-out golden retriever. All good, mate? Did you hit your head? Shikes! Can you remember what month it is? I'm fine. So, Bommy Tommy, should I assume... I think that's a safe assumption. Got it. Sounds like you've made the rounds at our prison. Is that where you met Frank? Ah, oh, Frank. Yeah, you could say we met in the clink. Guess you could say we're pen pals, eh? He's all right, I guess, but a bit of a wet blanket, know what I mean? Bit of a granny nanny, bit of a tuck you in sideways. I don't know what that means, but it's a mighty uncharitable way to describe someone who's lying to cover for you. He told me boldface that there was no way this crime was committed by someone who got released today. Oh no, he's right. I walked out a few days ago, got what I needed and said my fare thee wills. Got what you needed? Yeah, I'm just there to network. If you're new in town, there's no better place to be than prison. Meet like-minded folk, land a first few gigs, all with free room and board. All right, got it. You want to be the hot new hoodlum in Noir City. Take a number. But why Frank? What have you got on him that he's helping you this way? I'll tell you all about it, detective. But first, it sounds like I need you to be a witness in my little examination here. 
let's get down to business. This painting is going to look good on my wall, right next to my honorary Bachelor of Bigness and Badness. So, uh, what do I do? Where do I stand? You stand on the work you've done. You'll be judged on the crime you've committed, the one that's under all this rubble. Incidentally, Mr. Sutton, you didn't think about standing guard to make sure your work survived till the test began? Stand guard? I guess not. I thought I could count on the big, strong edifice of marble to stand up for itself. More fool me, never a dull moment in Noir City. All right, on to the crime. What do you think? Not so fast. Test taking protocol. Appearing in a burst of smoke has been against the rules for decades. We've got strict regulations on theme music. So your violation of those standards, should I mark it down as ignorance or defiance? Oh, uh, I like the sound of defiance. But say, I talked this over with some of the boys in prison and nobody mentioned... Now the crime itself. How did you plan it? Oh, you know, went in the way everyone does, bought a ticket, supported the arts, cased the joint during the day, then I hid and... And you made all those decisions yourself? Of course. Who else? So this list I stumbled across in the wreckage detailing the crime step by step. You wrote it? Well, sure. It's my to-do list. Can't be doing steps out of order, right? And those steps. Detective, you saw the scene. Did there happen to be any kind of signature? There was. A kind of twisty thing. Like a yin-yang. A yin-yang. Now there's taste list. And then there's Tasteless. Now hold on. It ain't some culturally appropriative piece of jewelry. It's my initials. My name's Oliver Sutton. So my signature is an O on top of an S. Am I, as the creator of the symbol, responsible for anticipating every hostile interpretation or... And finally, Mr. Sutton, the most important item on the rubric. Of all the objects in the world, all the bounty the lords of low light have created for us to steal, why this painting? Easy. It's badass, isn't it? <laughs> Pardon my French. There's a lot of right tripe in this museum. Was a lot of right tripe, rest in peace. Whereas this, it's got grit. It's got a point of view. Like if you ask this painter, how you doing? He or she would not say, oh, I'm fine. Ain't the sun nice reflecting off all the water? They'd say something real like, oh man, I'm hungover or my dog is missing. So you stole it because you like it. And you like it because it's real? Well, yeah. Interesting. I'm just giving it a cursory inspection. Aha. Uh -huh. I don't suppose you noticed this. Notice what? This tape recorder attached to the back of the frame. Tape r recorder? Hi! It's me, Stacy, from Stacy's Fakes. Were you fooled into thinking this was a one-of-a-kind, priceless artwork by a genius who died hungry? Did you steal it, thinking it was evidence of your discerning eye? Do you wish you could afford for people to think nice things? A forgery. Given this discovery, I've got to be honest with you, Sutton, it's a lost cause. So you buy into that stuff, eh? You buy into the record of artificial scarcity created by the art industry? Ain't you ever heard of the death of the author? If this is the bankrupt worldview of the high and mighty criminal status quo, I don't even want your photocopied credential. And thanks for nothing, detective. Rest assured, without either of your help, this town is going to know my name. It's Oliver Sutton. And I hope this gets in your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> Need some eye drops? No thanks. Uh, I always bring them on these things. Th this happens a lot. I'll see you around, Sockeye. I need to make sure this loose cannon doesn't hurt Frank. Oliver had a head start, but the collapse of the museum had spread a layer of dust over everything, and I could see a trail where he dragged the frame of the painting. It led me to the mouth of an alley. As I came close, I heard... the sound. I looked around the corner. The trail in the dust led right up to a dumpster, and I could see the edge of the painting sticking over the top. At the far end of the alley was Frank, standing by a parked car, reading a note. I wanted to speak to him, find out what it all meant. But as always, that night, I was a step too late. By the time I'd come out of hiding, Frank was in the car, driving away. So Oliver and Frank were connected, maybe even more closely than I- I beg your pardon? Holy! Whoa! Uh, where did you come from? Just for an evening stroll. Did you happen to drop this letter? Letter? 
It was lying on the ground behind you. Perhaps someone slipped in your pocket. Someone wants to put a smile on your face. For all I know, someone wants to put anthrax on my face. Just stay over there. Very well. Would you like me to read it to you? Uh, sure, yeah, I guess that couldn't hurt. All right. Ahem. Dear Mr. Detective, I'm writing you to ask for your help. I have nothing to offer you in exchange. I've learned this is the kind of city where nothing is given for free, but my hands are truly empty. I am a prisoner, but I don't know who my captors are. I don't know where I am. I barely know who I am. I only know what I overhear, and one thing I overhear is your name. I've heard it said that if Richard Tective could quit being such a sad sack and get his act together, he and he alone could save Noir City from the man called Belligerence T. Dubs. Perhaps then I do have something to offer you. I can warn you that you're in danger, at least as much as I am. And I can encourage you to quit being such a sad sack, get your act together, and find the danger before it finds you. I've persuaded one of the guards to bring you this letter, and I'm forced to believe that if anyone can solve this mystery, it's you. Tentatively yours, Soliloquy Long. Wow. So the missing woman, this has to be her. She's a real-life damsel in distress. There is such a thing as an innocent in Noir City. You just have to have amnesia. This is amazing. My only disappointment is that your voice didn't fade out partway through and get replaced by hers so I could hear what she sounds like. Hey, sorry I was so paranoid. Not to worry. We're all just kind of doing the best we can. Best of luck with your damsel. Thanks. She's going to be just fine. I did rescues like this all the time in the old days. What a nice person. With a terrible English accent. As the stranger slunk out, the facts sunk in. I'd heard from the missing woman herself, but even with that miracle, there still wasn't a clue about where she was. I'd do my due diligence, but I could already guess her name would turn up a blank. And as desperate as her situation sounded, so was Frank's. And in his case, the way forward was lit up like one of Dub's casinos. Something had happened in the prison, and judging by all the reactions to the canned beverage, that was where the beast had been released. On the way, I made a stop for a newspaper. I was top of my media literacy class in police academy, so I knew better than to trust the local rags outright. Exposition News, the Triple Tribune, the Noir City Narker. If you climbed far enough into the dizzying heights of their corporate structures, they were all owned by dubs. But I'd been beaten to crime scenes by enough journalists to know there were some sharp eggs out there. They knew how to dig up gold, and they knew just as well that Dubs would bury it again if they published it in plain view. So they got past him by burying it first, deep in the forgotten recesses of the print edition. Sure enough, the front page article about the mass release was hogwash. I stopped reading after I quoted one of the released prisoners as saying, I don't know why I'm here. I've literally never done anything to anyone. From there, I jumped from page to page, scanning the metro section, the funny papers, the missed connections, until my eyes caught on a familiar name. On page M54, an obituary, where the list of survivors included a distant cousin of a distant cousin, best known as the last remaining inmate at Noir County Prison. I made a last couple stops and headed for NCP. With most of my mortal enemies out on the street, walking into prison felt strangely safe. But of course, one mortal enemy is plenty, especially when that enemy is... Saul Slaughter. How's solitary confinement? Detective. And here I thought someone was practicing their duck calls. Let's get it nice and quiet again. I got a whole prison's worth of throwing shivs all to myself. Speaking of having things to yourself, you must be eating well, right? All the food you could possibly want. Save your ignorant opinions. Some of us understand the value of quality over quantity. Oh, I'm counting on it. See, when I read that you were the one person left here, I had to ask myself why. It can't have been a question of smarts. This place was loaded with minions and meatheads and goons who couldn't jaywalk without illustrated instructions. But I've got a guess about why you're different. I think it has something to do with this. I took a step closer and lifted up my gun arm. My hand was empty, but the can of Release the Beast had made a lot of mess in its short life, 
and the sleeve of my trench coat was soaked with the smell of cold pizza. Oh God, get it away! Get it away! I thought so. Gross as it may be, I keep running into inmates who think this stuff is ambrosia laced with crack. Why not you? So I did some web sleuthing. Slaughter's Butcher Shop, your old catering business? It had quite a few five-star reviews from a certain Shoogie Boogies 111, and that person was mighty opinionated. I perused their other reviews. A bakery. The baked Alaska was much smaller than the 663,268 square miles the name suggests. One star. A Mediterranean grocery store. Turkish delight tastes nothing like I imagined from the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. One star. Detective. Needlessly prolongs his exposition just so he can listen to himself honk. One star. Case in point. You're a hard man to please, Shuggy Boogies 111. So imagine my surprise when I saw that there was an exception. Stacy's Cakes. I just had to stop by and see the place for myself. And per your recommendation, I left with an apple pie. Oh no. With a croissant crust. Half Granny Smith? Half Cosmic Crisp. With Corvo Marbling? And a creme brulee smiley face on top. Mm. It was that bartender, Bart. They said he was here to taste test some new cocktail recipes on us, and the other inmates lined right up. But you didn't. Nor would anyone else who was still human. But prison turns people into animals. I watched as people I thought I knew drank whatever he put in front of them. Recipes not worthy of even a prison menu. The cake tartare, cinnamon vodka, buttercream frosting, and raw beef. The Greek island, ouzo with a float of yogurt. The polar bear swimming in lava, a glass of ketchup with an ice cube in it, but the last recipe. Ugh, please, just give me a pie. Not yet. The last drink. What was the point of trying it out on all of you? Is it addictive? Was someone trying to turn the prisoners into a pizza soda addicted army? Addictive? I saw people drink it until they couldn't drink a drop more, and then they started pouring it into their eyes. But it does more than that. Once you drink enough, it changes you. How? Completely. You can watch a person as their face, their fingerprints, their very social security number changes right before your eyes. They become unrecognizable, the opposite of who they were. And they develop terrible English accents. My God. You think you're surprised? Imagine the warden when he came in for his semi-annual head count. He barely recognized a single face. These weren't the people that he was supposed to have locked up. So he let them loose. Everyone but me. Saul. I know we're enemies, but dude, you could have gotten out of prison just by drinking something you don't like. This is the hill I would die on. I've let go of a lot of things, but there are lines my dignity won't let me cross. Now give me that pie and walk away. You're not worthy to witness the reunion. All right. Good luck, Saul. I promise I'll send you some company real soon. <laughs> I wish I could tell you I spent the walk out of the prison putting together the facts. How Oliver knew Frank because Oliver was Frank. And how Frank's release had put Oliver on the street days ago in time to plan his art heist in detail. But the truth is, that came later. Instead, as I walked by all those empty cells, I thought about the people who had been in them hours before. How they must have walked out of this place and just looked at the sky and breathed only to feel a craving set in, follow an impulse, and find themselves at the same bar as every other released beast, standing in the same line, waiting for a drink of their new prison. I wondered what those people might do, what they might break, just to convince themselves they were free. I could almost hear the cracks as something out there gave way, a sound like a face slamming into creme brulee. And I wondered who could possibly believe this was the way things ought to be. I know what you're thinking, Chief. Too many questions. Too little attention to the answers right in front of me. What was it you used to say? If it was a snake, it would have bit you? You were right. It was a snake, and I totally missed the rattle. It was all over in a second. A shove from one side, the slam of a cell door, and someone across my back pinning me against the bars. Out in the corridor, a big goon was smiling like he'd just invented pushing. And beside him came the slow, inexorable shuffle of BT dubs. In the instant before he pressed a monogrammed handkerchief over my face, I got the closest look I've ever had at the kind of hands that leave no fingerprints.
That was Noir City Blues, Episode 6, Me and My Shadows. It was written by me, Andrew Ferrier, with some really valuable help from Jeff Quash. You heard the voices of Jack Townsend, Erica Durr, Matthew Morris, High Priest Roby, James Lanius, Helen Schmel, Helen Jacks, Jeff Quash, Killian Gilbo, and Andrew Ferrier. They found Prince, but no match in the tourist database or anywhere else. What is this accent? <laughs> I don't know. I'm just doing white man. <laughs> <laughs>gets long in Noir City, long enough that the criminals work in shifts, and even the stars mostly handed in their resignations a long time ago. Then there's me and the rest of the lifers. We all ended up here in our own way. Noir City's an easy place to find. No matter where you are, Noir City is downhill. And if you slip and fall one day, you might find yourself here when you get back up. Us stubborn souls take this place as a personal challenge, and come night, You'll find us sprinting in our hamster wheels, just to prove we could get out if we ever tried. And even for us, sometimes a night stretch is so long we need to take a couple weeks break before we can finish it off. When we left off, I was indulging in just such a blackout. Unconsciousness is popular in Noir City, and I'm as big a fan as any. And sure, this particular blackout came courtesy of chloroform, which isn't usually my drug of choice. But a night's sleep is a night's sleep, even with your wrists tied behind your back. I always was a side sleeper anyway. So it figures that in the time it took for my kidnappers to get me from point A to point B, I got ganged up on by every nightmare in the book. There was a time when my nightmares used to be solitary predators, but in Noir City, even bad dreams are organized. The past 24 hours alone gave me plenty to worry about. The escape of every vengeful criminal I'd ever locked up. Detective? More like dictator. Die! The new drug going around on the street, an addictive drink called Release the Beast, that transformed those who drank it into strangers with unknown agendas. I'm a whole new woman. Sometimes. The mysterious thief who turned out to be the alter ego of my most reliable crime tech. The name's Sutton. All of us Sutton. And soliloquy long. A stranger abducted as she'd arrived in town. A mysterious woman with no memories, who I might already be too late to save. So yeah, even as nightmares go, this one was garish. But whatever demented child was drawing this dream was hell-bent on using every crayon in the box. I saw the old station, like it was the day I left. Blood on the wall, door hanging off its hinges. I saw her the way she was a few days before that when everything still seemed all right. Geared up for an adventure, ready for anything except what happened. I even saw something that might have been you, Chief. It looked just like I remember seeing you last. Accusatory, disappointed, like I'd betrayed her and you and even the memories themselves. Like I'd invited North City's forces to invade and conquer the inner sanctum where those memories live. I gave it my best, Chief. I tried to wake up, try to protect that place by exiling myself all over again. But my eyelids felt like an executioner's hood. So, Goon 2, you think this abduction is worthy of a Bachelor of Bigness and Badness degree? I've never seen wrists tied so badly. Didn't your boss say not to hurt him? It's all gone about as wrong as it could go. What do you mean you thought Goon 1 would do a better job? There's no job for you here anymore. Rotten luck. Better luck next time. For now, 
Just remember, if you want to minimize the harm, you've got to do the harm yourself. You did this to yourself, dick. My hands are tied. Not gonna lie, Chief. I was about to give you a piece of my mind. I know, it was only Dream You, but he's the only version of you I get to talk to these days. But when I opened my eyes to look you in the face, instead I saw the Tsar of Noir City himself, B.T. Dubs, with a golf club raised over his head. And it all came back. The ambush in the prison, and my promise to Dubs that I'd ignore the missing woman. A promise I hadn't broken. Yet. I didn't think I'd made a sound, but maybe Dubs heard my eyes opening. He gave me a glance and looked back down at the ball he was about to putt. Richard, wait a moment, would you? I'm ten for ten, or whatever they say in this peasant sport. A swing and a... Oh, look at that. Proof that I am but a fallible mortal. What a world, what a world. Where are we? Aboard the SS Large S, my yacht mansion. Your fancy digs, huh? This is a pretty plush kidnapping. Kidnapping? This is a job interview. Come, have a tour. It was hard to tell what was real aboard the Largesse. The sky couldn't be real. Too many stars. Or maybe Dub had just offered them better wages on his boat. And the waterfall? What makes a waterfall real, anyway? There was water, and it was falling. Seemed real enough. Don't interviews usually involve questions? Hmm. Offering me the opening move? Very well. There's been a death in the family, and it leaves quite the opening. You mean Rick? I always preferred to call him Rickard. Or Rickery, whatever his name was. Employees, best not to get too familiar. Same with the goons. They're always insisting that I call them goo. Wait, you had me ambushed and chloroformed so you could offer me Rick's job? Killing people and sabotaging corruption trials and- Rickert was a specialist. Here at Dubs Enterprises, the role is always constructed to the talents of the individual, with opportunities for further training, of course. What if I don't want the job? What if? What if you weren't graying? What if your wages kept up with inflation? What titillating little hypotheticals, eh? But if you prefer, think of it as keeping the job you already have. Regardless, it's time for a test. A test, huh? Maybe you haven't heard, but I was top of every class in police academy. And then I didn't show up to graduation. Acing the test and then lighting it on fire is what I do. What'll it be? Fight my way off your boat? Hotwire the engine? Seduce the navigatrix? Uh, none of the above, I'm afraid. But you're right that it's good old multiple choice. Simple. Will you help your friend at the crime tech with the transformation troubles? Or will you pursue the mystery of the missing Missy? So it's this again. You asked me to ignore a case. A detective never- uh, Miss Detective, I would never accuse you of being naive, but you're being stupid. Do you think you can solve every crime in this city? That you'll never have to make a hard choice between two important things? Or what? Do you think that any two cases you're assigned will always turn out to be connected? As a matter of fact, you'd be surprised how often- The answer is no, Miss Detective. Sometimes it's one or the other, and deep down you know it. After all, you let the case of the missing woman sit for a whole month. Until recently, you seem to have forgotten all about her. A lot of people in this town need my help. Anyway, I'm just a detective. The chief is the one who calls the shots. Only reason I'm paying attention to this case is because he's been on my back about it. He has, has he? Notwithstanding, there are still higher authorities than the chief, and this incredibly simple test can prove to them that you know how to prioritize. Shoot straight, Dubs. This isn't about proving I can juggle. These cases are as connected as they get, and the connection is you. You put money behind Bart when he invented his pizza-flavored soda that turns people into bad English accent versions of themselves. And just to cause more chaos, you got Bart access to the prison to test his creation. That way the prisoners would all get transformed into new people and released. Sorry, as I'm saying this, it all sounds incredibly contrived. Mm. Imagine having to listen to it. And you found Soliloquy and had her kidnapped. 
all for this creepy test of yours. Very good, detective. B minus and bonus points for good pronunciation. But you see, I didn't find Soliloquy. I created her. You're her father? What? No. Gotcha, sorry, that's just been the revelation so many other times. Uh, no, I created Soliloquy for this test. Since you tumbled into town, you've shown potential, but I worry that you have an incurable case of ISS, involuntary savior syndrome. Admittedly, there hasn't been a mystery you couldn't solve or a bleating innocent you couldn't save, but one wonders if those behaviors are compulsive. One would almost think there was a moment in your past when some woman desperately needed help you couldn't give, and that to this day you are throwing yourself into every breach, hoping to make up for that failure. Whoa, was I dreaming loudly? Hence, soliloquy. The perfect damsel. And by perfect, of course I mean dull as dry toast. Perhaps you've learned that she has no memories. In fact, there is nothing to her at all. Nothing to clash with your ideal. She is made up entirely of clues, occasionally dropped in your path to see if you take the bait. You're bluffing. If all that was true, why would you tell me? It's true, I shouldn't. It was meant to be a secret. But I understand human foible. Sometimes we need a shortcoming brought to our attention before it can be rectified. And to prove that I'm rooting for you, I offer you a lead. This friend of yours with the transformation troubles, as you've learned, his condition is the collateral damage of progress. The leaps of progress currently underway in beverage technology. But word has it that BevTech research is on the verge of another breakthrough, a formula that would reverse the condition and turn two people back into one. It may come to market soon, if you'll just have some patience. The yacht mansion left me ashore near my car. My gas tank was nearly empty, but still, I couldn't help flooring the pedal before I'd even put the car in gear. Dubs had gotten in my head and I was spinning my wheels trying to figure out his game. The clear, simple image I'd had of a helpless stranger was paling against a paralyzing profusion of possibilities. And even if she was real, the surest thing of all was that I was very, very late. Then another fact flashed into my head. Dubs had caused all this chaos just so there would be too many problems for one detective to solve, and he was betting on me being just one detective. Based on all precedent, he was right, but if I was gonna beat Dubs, I'd have to shake things up. I was gonna need our best crime tech. Frank might be captive to his Release the Beast addiction, but maybe now I knew enough to get him out of his cage. I walked into the bar to find Bart mobbed with shady-looking customers. <laughs> One at a time, fellas. There's enough for least the beast for everyone. Who's next? Me? Please? Me? I've been standing here waving for an hour. Hey, I know you. Flank tightly. I saw you in the paper. Will you sign your mugshot for me? Sure. Hand it here. But hey, while I've got you, could I get a 72-pack of- Aw, thanks. This is gonna look great in my new upstairs bathroom. You bought a house? Better, I'm building a house. And since there ain't a more beautiful phrase in the English language than upstairs bathroom, that's where I'm starting construction. The way sales are going though, won't be long before it's done and I can get started on the cellar door. So that's what you're doing with your dirty cash from Dubs. Oh no, Dick, the cash doesn't come from Dubs. The cash comes from the customers when they buy the product that gets made in the factory that got built with the loan from Dubs, which I'll start paying back as soon as I finish the house. He built you a factory? Right on the back of the bar, and still we can barely keep up. Bart, do you get why all these customers are so eager? Have you tried this drink? Oh no, I never drink my own medicine. Do it all by smell. But you know what it does, right? It changes you into a totally different person. Sure. That's what folks come here for. A change of pace, a chance to leave it all at the door. You, for example, 
When I think of all the times you started singing traditional Irish ballads in here, I could swear it was a whole other person. Never mind me. Look at Frank. Look how bad he feels. Frank, tell him how bad you feel. It's like there are fingers pressing on the back of my eyes, but you could just give me the drink and I would- Dick, I don't think you understand what my job is. I sell people what makes them feel good. No promises how long it's gonna last or how you're gonna feel when it wears off. Only promise is you're gonna like it. And people like this. Look, I just need to take away one of your customers. All I need is Frank. Dubs told me you were working on an antidote. What's it made of? Dick, I don't want the antidote. Sorry, Dick. You heard the man. Here you go, Flink. Who's next? Dick, I'm gonna hold off drinking this as long as I can, but... Hey, back there when we were looking at the art heist, I'm sorry I lied to you. You didn't lie. You just very carefully phrased the truth to mislead me. But it's okay, because that Oliver guy made you do it. And we're done with him. All you have to do is not drink that drink you're clutching very tightly and staring at, lovingly, like it's a child. Oliver isn't forcing me to do anything. We're friends. Frank, friends don't press on the backs of friends' eyes. Plus, he didn't act very friendly. He called you several names that honestly went over my head, but I seriously doubt they were compliments. That's just how he talks. But we've been writing each other letters for weeks, and he's a whole different- Jeez, he said you were pen pals. I thought he was talking about prison. See, he would be so happy to know he impressed you. And when we were in prison, the only people to impress were criminals, so he got really attached to the idea of doing a crime on his own, which, of course, I could never help him do, but- if I'm eventually going to get off this drink and end his existence, the least I can do is give him one good experience. So I wrote him instructions for an art heist that would look impressive without doing too much damage, and I called in that sockeye guy to give him the test so he'd get to enjoy some recognition. But everything went wrong, and now it wouldn't be right to end things this way, so I can't take the antidote yet. Frank, I never thought I'd hear you justifying aiding and abetting a criminal. And now that I hear you doing it, it's... Adorable. Thank you? But you can't let it get in the way of your job. With everything going on, we don't need another guy committing crimes. We need you helping solve them. I was kind of banking on you wanting to do everything on your own and barely noticing I was gone. And I wish I did feel that way, but that's what Dubs expects. So I have to surprise him by having friends. Plus, I think I could maybe actually use some help. I've kind of been through it today. I'm missing puns. That's just not like me. And Dubs just kidnapped me. Uh, I feel you. Captivity is rough. And I was in a collapsing building. I know. So was I. Plus, I've barely slept these last couple days. I have two people using my body. I haven't slept in a week, and I'm addicted to a thing that is inches from my face and is taking all my self-control to keep talking to you. Okay. You win. But just because you're more messed up doesn't mean I'm any less messed up. And speaking of messed up... I think you picking the stranger who you just met over me is messed up. No, I'm not choosing between helping you and helping him. I think I can help you both by letting him help you. What? Oliver doesn't need another crime. He just needs another chance, a way to leave his mark. And solving a crime might be just as good as committing one. You want me to ask him to help beat dubs? I get it. He's inexperienced, he's only existed for a week, you're gonna have to give him pointers and keep him on task. But even then, he is so much more qualified than I am right now. I promise. Now can I please drink this awful liquid pizza? Yeah, all right. See you on the other side. What is going on here? I leave Frank a note. Got to do another heist tonight. I'm gonna need the body. Please fuel it up and have it ready to go. And what does he do? He goes to the pub, and the body clearly has not had a meal or a nap. Blinking roommates. Oliver. Who? Ah, uh, uh, frack no. I've had about as much of you as I planned to tolerate. It wasn't my idea. Frank asked me to help you have a good time tonight. What a nice, uninvited gesture of pity, but no thank you. I came this close to pulling off my big heist. I'm gonna go finish it off. Frank literally scripted that heist for you, so I think we should do what he says. So it's all Frank, is it? I'm perfectly capable of looking at his instructions and extrapolating the general principles of criminality. You were just saying the body isn't in any shape yeah, to- Yeah, well, I've got an underdog redemption arc just cut right out for me. Plus, you just got out of prison. Compelling origin story. And you haven't slept in a week. Relatable obstacle. 
How will our hero overcome it? Oh, look, there's a presumably caffeinated beverage in my hand. With this kind of plot armor, I must be the protagonist of this episode. I'm not even sure what you drinking that would do. And anyway, caffeine doesn't give you skills. It just makes you panicked and anxious and emotionally volatile. Ugh, why is everybody so mean? <laughs> what did I do? What did you do? You just sat there through my Bachelor of Bigness and Badness test while Sockeye humiliated me. And now you're going to try to make me feel like I'm this burden on Frank? Let me tell you something. Frank might be miserable, but at least he can drink something and turn into someone else. I'm stuck being the someone else. I can't even get an English accent right. Look, for what it's worth, whatever you and I get up to tonight, we're going to hear a lot of bad English accents. And I'm betting yours is the least worst one out there. Seriously, for only having had a week of existence to work on it, you're doing a great job. Ugh, I wish my accomplishments didn't need the benefit of context to sound impressive. Well, look, I know you got written off by the criminal establishment tonight, but it just so happens that right now I could use a hand getting one over on the guy at the top. If that sounds interesting or, you know, objectively impressive. Tell me this. Is he a condescending jerk like Solomon Sockeye? Oh, a hundred times worse. Then count me in. I'd succeeded at getting Oliver on my team, which wasn't what I'd set out to do, and I wasn't sure I was any better off for it, so I decided to go double or nothing and look for even more backup. And let's just say... there weren't a lot of options. Richard? Dr. Morgan Jordan! How are things at the morgue? Absolutely dead, and not in a good way. I you keep hearing that the entire prison was released and a crime wave is coming. But so far, I've just been waiting like a nervous schoolgirl the night before prom, sitting by the phone and alphabetizing my scalpels. Well, listen, maybe it would be fun if you were to leave the morgue and come out and help me on a crime scene. M me? Is it some kind of corpse analysis problem? I can just talk you through it. All you need is a kitchen knife, or a sharp stick, or just a really well-filed fingernail. It's not so much your specialty I need, Dr. Morgan Jordan. Just a spare pair of eyes. Oh, I have lots of- Sorry, poor wording. I just thought your analytical skills might be helpful. It's hard to imagine a stranger idea. I'm profoundly unsuited. I barely know how to navigate the outside world. I sleep here most nights. Whoa. Like, inside the morgue? Oh, yes. We keep the drawers very comfortable. And besides, this place would fall apart without me. I have to micromanage. You'd be surprised at how hard it is to find good help. Yes, I'm starting to understand that. I mean, I'm so obviously the wrong choice that I can only imagine one reason why you might ask me. It must be that I'm the protagonist of this episode. I think you're probably 100% right about that. In that case, who am I to decline the wily advances of destiny? I'm on my way! So the motley crew assembled. Oliver and I met up with Morgan Jordan near the seedy hotel where Soliloquy had gone missing. Beverly? Beverly? I need you to stop being hysterical and listen to me. Hold it up to the phone and squeeze it. Once more? That's definitely a spleen. Fill out the paperwork and don't do anything else without my explicit instruction. Bodies start rolling in as soon as you left? It's to be expected. Protagonists are always managing multiple problems at the same time. Well, gentlemen, let's get down to business. All right. Men, we're an unlikely team. A detective, a thief, and a mortician. Maybe that's not a classic formula for success. Maybe the odds are against us. But I think we can safely say... There's no way Dubs is going to see this coming. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Anyway, we're here to investigate the kidnapping of an innocent woman. She might be a real-life innocent woman with a personality and history and stuff, or she might be just the idea of an innocent woman. Along the way, we're also likely to run into interference. The entire prison is on the loose, and we need to make sure we don't become targets. It's time for some police academy. Lesson one, moving silently. You've got to sort of sneak and swagger at the same time. That way folks won't hear you. But if they look, they'll think you're sneaking up on someone for charming reasons and they won't want to ruin the surprise. Here, try it. 
good. Now my personal trick. Try describing it in your head as you do it, preferably in the past tense. Like this. I wafted in a whispering waltz across the walkway. I'm I'm the meter of a mute mazurka. I patter over the pavement to the pulse of the most private possible polka. Good enough for now. Let's move on. Training was giving me flashbacks, but I couldn't afford the time on memory lane. We needed to get on to lesson two, roles in the investigation. I was dreading this one. I'm pretty good at the knowing what other people should do part, but I always forget to say it out loud. Fortunately, I determined that Oliver would be a... Um, Oliver, you're our professional ex-con. I can't be expected to remember everyone I've ever locked up, so I need you to see them coming. All right. Less gentleman thief, more human Rolodex. Not the career I anticipated, but I am full of undiscovered potential. I'm afraid I won't be much use in that department. It's safe to say that I know the typical Noir City criminal inside, but not out. No worries, Dr. Jordan. You'll help me with evidence gathering and analysis. If we come across a criminal, you can observe from a distance and try to figure out their strengths and weaknesses. Here, let's practice. Lesson three, encounters with hostiles. Oliver, from this excellent surveillance position we snuck to, what do you see? Frike. There's one right now, right across the street. I remember her. They call her Blunt Force Blanca. We're probably safe from this one. See, slung over her shoulder, that huge, heavy-looking bag with the dollar sign on it? Safe to say this tick has probably sucked all the blood it can for one night. Wait, do you mean actual blood? Morgan Jordan, shush. Did someone say blood? Oh God, it's true. <laughs> Who's that hiding? Is that detective? Ho oh, I've been waiting a long time to get some candy out of this piñata. <laughs> oh yeah? What are you gonna do? Hit me with your giant bag of money? Oh god, she's gonna hit me with her giant bag of money! Oh yeah, you're about to be legal tender! I leaned back to avoid the hit. It came so close I could read E Pluribus Unum through the canvas. I had to give it to her. Blunt Force Blanca had a heck of a rotator cuff. Dick, I know you're busy, but do criminals really collect blood? Stop saying blood! Oliver, a little help? Oi, fresh out of prison, new lease on life, ain't you got better things to do? Oh, nothing beats the simple pleasures. Eat, pray, love, bludgeon a detective. Uh. Got it. Carry on then. Oliver! What? It worked before. Is this what they mean, what they say out for blood? Is it literal? <laughs> Oliver! Your job! Right. Uh, they call her Blunt Force Blanca. I know that already! <laughs> and it, it's coming back to me. They call her that because... <laughs> because she hits things. I get it. Yeah, but she prefers Blunt Force because, uh... <laughs> oh, because she freaks out at the sight of blood. I said stop saying blood! Oh god, here, just take it! Covered me in blood! That's right, back off, you... Whoa. Morgan Jordan, what did you do? I had a spare blood bag in my pocket. Wasn't that what she wanted? There's blood everywhere. I'm lightheaded. Where did you get that idea? Blood is valuable. I'm barely getting away with my life in this big bag of money. That one was O negative too. Stay far away from the detective and especially the man in the lab coat. She didn't even mention me. Guess no one will be bothering us now. This is much more fun than I'd expected. Whew, that took it out of me. I'm all hot. Would you like to cool your wrists on a nice, refreshing blood bag? I've got more. No, thank you. With the first thread out of the way, it was time to investigate the hotel. We surveyed the block. It was a rough neighborhood. The kind of place- The kind of place where even the windows spent their lives behind bars. Where the bulbs in the street lights unscrew themselves just to avoid being seen. All right, that's enough. That well-lit door over there, that's our place. Let's go. Hi, welcome to Stacy's Lakes. Hang on, you're that detective. Wow, I just got done reporting the crime. Are you joking? I'm a month late. Hang on, this is Stacy's Lakes? I was going to come here on vacation. Where are the lakes? They're... 
Look, we have a long-term landscaping plan from a very reputable firm called Stacy's Rakes, but since we opened, we've learned that customers in this part of town care less about beauty and comfort and serenity and more about anonymity and discretion and multiple exits. Fair enough. Anyway, we're here about the- Yes! It was only a few minutes ago. I just put all our money in the cash bag when the burglar came in and- Wait, there was a burglar? We're not here about a burglar. Oh, though if it's any consolation, she's probably covered in blood right now. Then why are you here? To see the room where the woman went missing. It's upstairs, but that was a month ago. Is it going to be another month before someone comes about the crime that just happened now? Maybe. Look, there are a million new crimes happening as we speak, but this cold case is more urgent than any of them. So I don't have time to- Not so fast. I haven't been able to rent out that room for a month. Your chief told me I had to leave it how it was until the detective in charge came by and looked at it. And given the financial hardship that represents, I've been selling tickets to see it. That's very creative, but we don't pay to look at crime scenes. Excuse me, good woman. I couldn't help but overhear. Oh, God! Who are you and why are you covered in blood? I haven't the foggiest, but did I hear you say that someone burgled this lovely establishment and took a sack of money? (laughs) For reasons I'm not certain of, I happen to have come by this sack of money and I insist you take it. Why, this... This comes to exactly the amount that was stolen. We're gonna go upstairs now. Okay, sure. Go right ahead. All was quiet in the stairwell, quiet enough for me to realize that the radio on my hip was going bananas. The dispatchers were tripping over their own tongues, calling in crimes from every corner of town. Morgan Jordan's phone was going, too. What do you think you should do, Beverly? No, that's wrong. This is why you haven't been promoted in 14 years. Those employees of mine, why can't they take a risk once in a while? All right, you two, lesson number... Whatever. Crime scene work. For starters, we do not walk into the room. First, we stand here, outside the door, and we look in. That way we don't taint the scene with our presence. What do we see? Look here. A little ribbon draped across the doorway. Probably meant to make sure people didn't walk in and taint the scene with their presence. Very saggy. Probably from how many people have stepped over it. On the other side of the tape, impressive amounts of garbage. Candy wrappers, ticket stubs, pamphlets for tourist attractions, and countless muddy footprints. Based on the taste of this mud, I'd estimate this crime scene has sat neglected for about a month. Uh, good job? We're looking for whatever's left from before all these people walked through. Easy to say, but this was no job for beginners. Hunting down our clue was going to be a real doozy. But I couldn't help thinking of what the place had looked like before it became a tourist attraction. Just a bed and a chair. The kind of place made for kidnappings. Soliloquy deserved better. I'll step in and look around, shall I? Beverly, all I'm hearing is problems. I need you to come up with solutions. The sharp-eyed but indescribably wary thief spots a bed. He is sorely tempted to take a nap. But first... He inspects the bed closely for telltale signs of bedbugs. Signs burned inexorably into his mind by several days spent in prison. Beverly, I really can't overstate how impossible it is to get things done with you hounding me like this. What about this pamphlet? I looked to see what Morgan Jordan had found. In his hand, crumpled and almost unreadable under the mud, was a pamphlet advertising a tour company that took visitors to see the homes of the rich and famous. It looks like any of the other garbage in this room. Yes, but if you take a moment to classify the various shoe prints on the floor, you'll find that this is the only object that bears all 17 types. So, it was here before anyone walked through. And when I open it, of course using my sterile gloves and tongs, I find a long hair inside, rolled up as if someone put it there on purpose. Let me see. Look at that. It's right on the page where they talk about Dubs's yacht mansion. What if that's where he's holding her captive? Hold your horses, you two. It's good detective work, but even if this pamphlet is the dirtiest thing in the room, as evidence goes, it's clean. Too clean. Dubs is toying with us again. Maybe, but think about the timing. 
Earlier, you received a letter from a missing woman, and almost immediately, Dubs abducted you. I suppose it's possible Dubs just decided to come out swinging today after a month of secrecy, but doesn't it seem likelier that someone else is dropping evidence in your path and that Dubs found out and felt the need to create a cover story? Dang, that's twisted. I've had a 30-year career of trying to figure out the motive of dead people. And, and, sorry, I just said that hoping I'd think of something to add to the conversation. Oh, and if she is being held on the yacht mansion, then Dobbs was telling you that soliloquy didn't exist while you were standing right next to her. Wouldn't that warm the cackles of his dastardly heart? It is hard to imagine Dubs letting an opportunity like that pass. Either way, it's the only clue we've got. Hello? Hmm, that does sound challenging, Bev. But I say, use your own judgment. Being trusted to figure things out is empowering. The hotel room had told us all it could. We walked outside to figure out our next steps. This was easy. Perhaps I'll moonlight as a detective. Dang, Warden Jordan gets a lot of calls. Maybe he is the protagonist of the episode. Oh wait, this one's me. <laughs> Let's see. Oh, that's not a call. That's a new video from a channel you like. Sure, that sounds important. Welcome back to Stacy's Takes. As crime skyrockets across Noir City, so have random acts of kindness. As I speak... There is not a single old lady waiting to cross the street or cat stuck in a tree anywhere in the greater metropolitan area. What's going on? Has shared hardship inspired people to take civic responsibility in their own hands? Is this a sign that people are really essentially good? Or will all this kindness make us soft? Are we better off getting mugged so we'll be ready when we eventually get mugged? I honestly don't know what to think. Oh, in other good news, this episode is supported by our first sponsor ever, Release the Beast. It's a brand new product from the mother company that needs no introduction and whose name shall not be spoken. Huh? Did she already make another- Wait, shouldn't we hurry up and- Oh, this one's an actual call. It's the chief. All right, we'll just stand there and wait some more. Chief, what's up? <laughs> The chief is in the other room. He was kind enough to lend me his phone when I, clumsy mumsy that I am, left all of my phones in the limo copter. Dubs, what are you doing at the precinct? I couldn't stop thinking about what you said. About how you'd forgotten all about this missing woman nonsense until the chief started reminding you about it. Well... He... Of course, you couldn't know that I'd previously chatted with the chief about that very matter, but it does disappoint. One wonders whether the chief is incompetent or incompliant or both. Oh, the chief is very forgetful. Well, except when he's reminding me about cases. But when I ask him to remember to forget things, he always... Fortunately, Miss Detective, I'm not calling you for solutions or insight. I just thought you might be interested in listening to a little experiment. Chief, are you with us? Loud and clear. Chief, have you met Goon One? He's placing a little cup in front of you. Why don't you have a taste of the contents? I don't see why not. It smells like cold pizza. A food about which I have completely neutral feelings. No, Chief, leave it! Uh, uh, oh, Constable Dodgen here. I'm here to help you solve all your murders and look for any pennies you've lost down skirts, that sort of thing. You know how it is these days. Always looking out. Hear that, detective? A whole new law enforcement professional born screaming into the world. Might this one out do, our dear old Chief? Mr. Dudgeon, how are you at following orders? Well, you know how orders are, old chap. Sometimes you gotta do it, sometimes you gotta do something else. It depends. Maybe we'll go have a pint after that. I don't know. You've made your point, Dubs. Leave him alone. But we're only just starting. I told you, this is an experiment. Constable, I'm so sorry. We must see other candidates. Uh, Goon Wong, give whoever this is another sip. Oh, no, I'm quite... <laughs> Who calls for Lord Lucius Gucius? I am here only to teach tennis. What the? 
a different one? As I told you, we've been experimenting with new formulas. Surely you didn't think an antidote was the extent of our research? We've come across a recipe that brings out a whole menu of alternates, each one a prospective improvement on the original, and perhaps a permanent one. All it would take is a small daily dose. Might this one be who we're looking for? Good, sir. I would be happy to run this police station. I can absolutely take over and solve all of the murders here, like I did with your mother last night. Uh, perhaps not, but we soldier on. Give another sip, goon one. No, sir, I think I'll... Uh, uh, mm. I'm Vanessa Von Boom, and I'm here to tell you that this is the worst cold pizza beverage that you can possibly conceive of. Who made this? It's terrible. Quite the field of candidates for police chief, detective. Care to throw your hat in the ring? Oh, yeah, throw your hat in the ring now. We'll see how that goes. That'll be a good one, won't it? Throw your hat in the ring. Hit the tail of the donkey. Uh, madam, where did you get that broom? Hold her off, goon one. Well, detective, seems with some people, incompetence is incurable. But rest assured, we always find a way. Gold blimey. That's Dubs? I knew he was a villain, but he's a right cold. Dang, I got the chief in a bind. I gotta get over there. Hold on, Dick. Think for a moment. We have a double advantage right now. Okay, uh, one. We know where Dubs and at least one of his goons are located. Ideal timing to make a strike. And what's the other one? Dubs has always shown a preference for working behind the scenes. But tonight he's making open displays of force, which I don't suspect he'd do unless you're very much afraid of something. Most likely, you. That stopped me in my tracks. Could it be true? Could I really be such a threat in Dubs' eyes? A detective of such unequal promise that... Ow! Oh, my goodness. Did a paper plane just hit you in the eye? Ow, 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 that really... Ah. Pick it up. Solomon Sockeye, what are you doing up in that tree? I dropped that letter right in front of you several times. You walked past it several times. So I folded it into a paper plane and threw it at your head. Now you will pick it up and walk away and start paying some dad gummed attention. So called detective can barely see past the end of his nose. Can't even look me in the eye, you feel so guilty. Wait, Solomon? Solomon! Oh, I keep thinking of things too late. Somebody, is this another letter from Soliloquy? It appears to be. The first one showed up right after I saw Solomon. He's been the one slipping clues from her, not Dubs. You were right, Morgan Jordan. Dubs was bluffing. What's to say? Here, you read it for me. Can't you read it yourself? No, dude, my eye isn't working. And anyway, I have to operate the music box. All right, geez, fine, let's see. Nice handwriting, working with a pen. 0.5 nib, I'd guess. Left-handed. Just read it. All right, excuse me for detecting. Let's see. Miss Detective, writing in an agony of haste. Prospects for salvation slimmer than ever. You are sole hope. Man, I was really hoping your voice would fade out and get replaced with hers this time. I can't wait to see who's gonna play her. Captors have moved me. Gave one of them a black eye, but no escape. A black eye? Man, I hadn't guessed Soliloquy could fight. Dick, we still don't know whether she exists. Just because Dubs wants you to believe she doesn't, doesn't mean she does. That's manipulation 101. There's more. New location unknown, but constant hum, constant smell. We all took a deep breath. It's crazy what you can get used to when it's in the air you breathe. But now that I thought about it, the letter smelled like cold pizza. They've moved her to the Release the Beast factory. We were right there. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So this letter points us toward the factory. So now we've got two locations, that and the Yacht Mansion. Could I suggest... Morgan Jordan, you're doing weirdly great, but I need to talk this out. So, Solomon has been delivering these clues, and he's trustworthy, so they're probably both real. And Dubs knows I'm on the trail, which is why he's had her moved, so he probably expects me to show up at the Yacht Mansion. And so it's probably heavily guarded. <sighs> All right, gentlemen, we've got to go to both places. That means splitting up. And since there are three of us, one of us will be going alone. I'll be heading to the factory to save Soliloquy. Who wants to hang with- I'll go, go alone! Okay. Jeez, that felt personal. Wait, 
Oliver, you might change back into Frank any time, right? Yeah, I'm a team of two all by myself. I just have to leave him a note. Okay, I know I just stood here reading a note for a while, but there's not going to be time for reading notes. Wait, have you even learned to drive? What, heroes can't get dropped off? Dick, if I may, I couldn't help noticing your back seat is full of fedoras and trench coats. If Dubs is expecting you to be alone, I suggest we fulfill his expectations by all dressing as you. That way, we can watch for Dubs at both locations, and whoever finds him can make it a point to be seen, hence clearing the way for the other party to proceed undetected. As for who goes alone to the yacht mansion, it should be me, because I have a van full of spare body parts, and if I'm attacked, I can throw some limbs around, and they'll think I've been maimed. I don't think either of us can argue with that unique qualification. Very well. I'll set off for the yacht mansion, and I wish you both Godspeed. And it was then that I realized that Destiny had been calling for a long time. I just hadn't heard the phone ringing. Thirty years with the dead had all been building to this, to finally saving a life. Beverly, thank you. I feel an enormous respect for you, too. I think, I think he might be the protagonist. Yeah. <laughs> Oliver and I made our way back to the bar, and for the first time, we looked over the factory built onto the back of it. Upwind, downwind, anywhere we went, the stench of cold pizza was inescapable. The place was brand new, but for some reason the neighbors were already calling it the old factory. From a safe position outside, we established a radio connection with Morgan Jordan. Chances were that Dubs had people monitoring all the frequencies, so we pulled an old detective trick and used an infrequency. We listened as Morgan Jordan arrived near the yacht mansion, heard the sound of countless propellers as the limo copter approached, and as Morgan Jordan approached Dubs' security, Oliver and I learned what it sounded like when a spare arm goes flying, hits a semi-automatic weapon, and sends bullets flying in every direction. Basically, it was way too cool to play. And if you think I sound jealous, you should have seen Oliver's face. I sort of thought when we got started that I'd be the one doing that stuff, but it's fine. I guess a 30-year career earns you something. I've been thinking. Do you have any memories before Frank drank that stuff and brought you here? Nothing. Ain't that funny. I knew my name and who I was, but as far as how it all got there, your guess is as good as mine. No memories, huh? And then it hit me. Maybe I should have seen it long before, but Dubs had wanted to overwhelm me, and it had worked. Oliver, in Soliloquy's letter, she said that she doesn't have any memories. I think she must be like you. Cool. So she spent her entire life in captivity. Now we've really got to get her out. I didn't disagree, but I could see Oliver and I were diverging into different conundra. He had the bind of his own short-lived kind in mind. But me? All I could wonder was who Soliloquy had been before Dubs got his hands on her. Morgan Jordan reported that he'd successfully retreated, leaving a crowd of Dubs' goons standing bewildered among a heap of loose body parts. It was time to advance. Around back of the factory, we found an open loading dock. Inside, the place sounded as noisy as it smelled. But all the machines were on automatic, and there wasn't a soul to be seen. We zigzagged between countless stacked flats of canned soda. Finally, we got a view into a big central corridor lined with too many doors, all wired up to a shiny, state-of-the-art electronic lock system. And dead center of the building, the big computer console that held the keys to the kingdom. A couple of Dubs' goons paced back and forth on guard, big clubs over their shoulders. Moment of truth. Now's when we run out and take those guys down. Hold up. No way we can take them both out before they call back up. We've got to get rid of them some other way. Man, it's almost easy. I mean, they're surrounded by a drink that transforms you into a different person. But Dubs has to have told them not to drink it. We could sneak it into their food. Yeah, but it smells like cold pizza. You couldn't possibly not notice it. Huh. You know what else smells exactly like cold pizza? Neither of us spoke but we'd both had the same idea. And lucky for us, I had my neighborhood noodle and pie joint, Ma and Pa's Pa and Za on speed dial. Hello, Pa. Could you deliver a cold Za? Sure, I'd love one with Italian saw. And throw in a couple glasses of wah. Thanks. Now, Oliver, listen. 
When this pizza gets here, I need you to yell for the guards so they'll come and eat it. Wait a minute. This whole mission, I haven't gotten to steal anything or attack anyone or do any of the things about which I feel unearned confidence. The one place where I've expressed reasonable self-doubt is my voice. And that is what you ask me to use? Yes, because every criminal in Noir City already knows my voice. The only way they're going to eat it is if they think the pizza is a present from one of their goon friends. But I don't sound like them. Hey, we talked about this. You are far and away the best bad accent haver in your age bracket in this city. All your work has been building to this moment. Make me proud. Here's the pizza. Thanks, Pa. And then we just grab one of these cans of Release the Beast Extra Strength and... Oh, so gross. All right, go for it. Remember, strong and wrong. Hey, you guys, it's me, Goon 12. How's it hanging? You working hard or hardly working? Anywho, just wanted to say sup and thanks for your service. And to show that I think you're just Yankee Doodle Dandy, I'm leaving you a big old pizza. Hope that's neato. Okie dokie, see y'all on the flip side. Oh God, that was somehow the most thrilling experience of my life. Hey, Goog 3, did you hear? A fellow member of the Brotherhood of Good Kind brought us a pizza. Yeah, and it's cold. Dude, I love cold pizza. Oh, and it's soggy and carbonated. Is there any more beautiful phrase in the English language than cold, soggy, carbonated pizza? Pe- <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> Oh, y'all, do I really have to do the accent? Yeah, come on. The rest of us have already made fools of ourselves. Oh, God. Um, where are we? What are we doing here? Uh, hello there, strangers. How are you? Need a hand with anything? Are you an old lady or perhaps a cat? No, but I saw an old lady cat trapped behind that security interface. If you go swing your club around and hit a lot of stuff, maybe you can set her free. Swing a club, you say? I, who have literally never done anything to anyone? Very well. Stand back, old cat woman. The crashes and bangs were like a symphony, and buried deep in it was the sweet percussion of doors unlocking. We started to turn the building upside down, hunting for soliloquy. It should have felt like the end of the race, but for all my bluster, I could feel Dubs' jaws closing around me. Dubs had told me straight that soliloquy was invented, that she was tailor-made to take me back to the worst moment of my past. And sure, he'd been lying, but he'd still been right. That was how Dubs did it. He held the truth right in front of you, contorted just enough to make you doubt it. All the better to enjoy the moment when you realized you'd been had. Oliver was the one who found her, soaking wet and starting to get cold. It was a woman I'd never seen before. Could have been anybody. Seated on the floor, back against the wall, a piece of paper in her lap that said, Wrong choice. And next to her, the vat of Release the Beast they must have drowned her in, that they'd been drowning her in for who knows how long. Oh my god. I'm sorry, Dick. I bet she was gonna be played by, like, Judy Dench or someone. Should we carry her out so she can at least have a funeral or something? No. Funerals are for the living, and no living soul ever got to know this woman. She was created to hide someone else, and that someone is buried too deep for us to find. We trudged back to the great open heart of the factory. The destruction of the computer console had started a small fire of loose paper and cardboard. And the remade goons, so newly initiated into life, were reverently toasting marshmallows. I wonder if we shouldn't light the whole place up. That would eliminate the substance that allows you to exist, buddy. I know, but I've been looking for something objectively impressive to do since I got here, and I think this is it. Don't make me think too hard about it. It didn't take much to persuade the new goons to help us make the fire as big as we could. Although first they talked us into a round of marshmallows. It was nice. I called the fire department as we retreated to an overlook. 
I told the goons life would be more fun if they got out and made the most of the next little while. Didn't have the heart to tell them why. Oliver and I watched as the flames in the fire trucks mingled their complimentary reds. I looked over to see what he thought of his handiwork. You know, I think all that thief business was just peer pressure. Yeah, deep down, I think I'm an arsonist. Lots of folks don't find their calling before they go. Anything else in the time you've got left? You know what else I've felt a wild craving for all my life but never tried? Sleeping. That sounds like the next great adventure right now. Hi, hey, Frank's a good kid. Look out for him. I will. Play me some finale music. All I've got is this. Not remotely what I had in mind, but you did your best. <sighs> Dick. Whoa. Solomon? Ending with a fireworks display, I see. Just the kind of kitsch I'd expect from you. It was Oliver's idea. I know. I was watching. So you found her. And you... figured it out? Yeah. Here. She wrote you this before they changed her. It's too bad she didn't live. But then again, who does? Hey, I want to say thank you. I don't know what your part in this whole thing was, but you took a risk sneaking those letters out. It's good to know I've got friends. Oh, so you haven't figured it out. All right. I'm the one Dubs hired to kidnap your old friend and stand guard over her. I've been with her every day since she first set foot in town. I agreed not to speak to or help the woman I kidnapped. When they decided to force feed her a daily dose of release the beast, she became a different person. You knew who she was and you didn't- Don't preach of me, detective. I dropped you every clue I could get away with. Not my fault you weren't quick enough to put things together. Anyway, I didn't show up so you could cry on my shoulder. I need you to pass something on to Frank when he wakes up. Here. It's Oliver's Bachelor of Bigness and Badness. Wait, what? The test I gave him earlier tonight? Crime I judged. You stood there and described the scene for me. Yeah, a lot has happened since then. Anyway, you said he didn't measure up. We always say that. We don't find the best by seeing who can follow rules. Everyone gets a bad score at first. The real test is what they do afterwards. That's what I've been watching. Tell Frank, considering Oliver only existed for about a week, he was as big and as bad as they get. Not a compliment, just a fact. And detective, think about laying low for a while. Life's about to get a lot tougher. to Stacy's takes. The news just keeps on coming. The unprecedented crime wave that terrorized Noir City has come to a crashing halt. And why? Was it police action? Community activism? A change of heart? Nope. It's drugs. Turns out all the released prisoners were addicted to a substance that suddenly ceased to exist. And they now lie racked with agony. Are drug withdrawals an acceptable solution for crime? Does anyone have control over anything? I honestly don't know what to think. Oh, also, this show was allegedly sponsored by Release the Beast, but the check bounced. Yes, faithful listeners, on this show we never draw a paycheck or a conclusion. <laughs> the show is now for all practical purposes, sponsored by Stacy Steaks, Shakes, Wakes, Rakes, Lakes, Fakes, and Cakes. Are you tired? Grind got you down. Wouldn't it be nice if someone else did the work for a change? Longing for a big chunk of meat? A memorial service? A getaway to a place where nobody knows your name? Can anyone do them all? I honestly don't know what to think. Also, Next time on Stacy's Takes, has anyone in Noir City ever heard an actual English person? When I got home, I stood under the shower head, fully dressed until the water ran cold. And then I read her letter. It was older than I'd expected, dated before the hotel even reported her missing. She said, Hey, partner. Just writing to let you know I'm on my way to find you. 
Still, still haven't gotten, gotten any answers, answers to my, to my last, last 20, 20 letters. letters. I may be out of the game, but I'm starting to suspect you don't want to see me. Or, for all I know, you're held captive somewhere and you're screaming for me to show up. I guess it wouldn't be so bad coming out of retirement to save your scrawny behind. Again. Anyway, there's a reason I'm not taking no for an answer. The chief hasn't got long, and he deserves to hear from you before he goes. I'm not taking his side. It's still got a way on you, too, and the world deserves to see what you can do at your best. Maybe I'm crazy, but I keep thinking all you need is a good shake by the shoulders, and I've always been first in line to give you those. So ready or not, here I come. Your old partner in crime, Shirley Shanks. The next night, I was right back where I started, at the bar with Bart. One day I was riding high, and now... The stock and the recipes are all burned. My funding got pulled, and all I have to my name is a half-finished bathroom 20 feet in the air. How about that? Life took me down in a hot second, and I never saw it coming. I've got to get better at this deduction thing. Tell me again how you figured it out. Wasn't so complicated. An old friend got in touch to ask me to do something important. Dubs had someone reading my mail, and he didn't like what she was proposing. So he kept her letters from me. And when she came to town, he had her kidnapped. And her news had a deadline, so all Dubs had to do was run out the clock. He kept me busy, made me promise not to investigate, and he invested in your drink, thinking it might transform everyone in Noir City into his perfect lackeys. Didn't work out that way, but he still got one use out of it. When I finally got on her trail, he hid her from me by turning her into someone else. I told you, you got to share these stories. That deserves a tip. Put it in my ko-fi. Anyway, it's not all neat and tidy. Frank's a mess. Oliver and a bunch of other people don't exist anymore. And apparently it's a real bad time to be in the pizza business. And who knows, maybe if I had just let it go, Dubs would have let her go too. Nah, Bart. Deduction is all well and good, but just because you can detect it doesn't mean you can affect it. There's just one thing I haven't figured out. Probably never will. What's that? The music box I found in Rick's office. It's the reason I broke my promise to Dubs and started looking for her. Rick was a bad guy, but this made me wonder how he got that way. Who he used to be. Might this have represented some kind of memory Here, that- Here, let me see that. Well, for one thing, it's covered in gold plating. It's... Well, I'll be. Chief. It is Chief, isn't it? morning, Dick. Or whatever time it is. How are you feeling after last night? Funny you should mention last night. I don't remember anything. But I woke up with a splitting headache. Anyway, you wanted me to call? Yeah, question. If, hypothetically, some mail addressed to me got misdirected to someone like Rick, any idea how I might track it down? Mm, you know I don't touch the mail. It's hard enough to keep this department going without micromanaging. If you didn't find it when you cleaned out his office, chances are he used it for one of those departmental bonfires he was so fond of organizing. I figured. That's all I needed, boss. One more thing, Dick. Take a vacation. Judging by the headache, I must have taken some time off myself last night, and I don't want to be the cow painting the goat brown. Thanks, Chief. Never change. So I put away my badge, sold the music box, and used the cash to buy a one-way train ticket. The only thing harder than staying in Noir City is leaving. It's uphill all the way, and no matter when you depart, the trains all arrive at the same time. Too late. Anyway, you can never get this city to commit to anything as clear as a border. The place never stops sprawling, and for all I know, its sinewy suburbs may have long since wrapped around the place I used to call home. But then, maybe they didn't. Maybe it's the days that are surprisingly long there. Maybe I'll need a repertoire of heavy-handed metaphors about the sun. Let's see, the sun outside Noir City is like... like a really bright street light. Okay, I can do better than that. The sun outside of Noir City is like, uh, grapefruit. Bigger than most things in its category and intense, but in a nice way. No, oh, this is hard. But I've got the whole ride to work on it.
three, two, one. The city is like no other. She's beautiful, unpredictable, dangerous, like a cat inviting you to touch her belly. Noir City is a mystery, wrapped in an enigma, covered in bacon, and deep fried for five minutes, then coated in sprinkles. Dangerous sprinkles. I wish the same could be said for our scum, but in Noir City, a low life is a low life. Busters, bruisers, thugs, goons, they're all the same. Be bad, get paid. No nuance, no art. Same story, same ending, every time. I guess that's one thing that the Reaper and I have in common. One way or another, the bad guys always come to us to be measured. When I see them on my table, I'd like to imagine the last thing that went through their minds. Probably something like, I thought I was special. Guess not. Who'd have thunk? It's the elites that really make me want to gag. Kingpins are nothing but criminals who figured out bureaucracy. To some, a 20-story yacht mansion might seem to be the ultimate sign of a life well lived, but the man in that high castle isn't immortal, and sooner or later, he'll end up downtown with me, wearing nothing but a towel and a toe tag. I like to think that tonight, I gave him a taste of that future. Nothing evokes mortality like watching your hired goons clean up a pile of miscellaneous limbs. After scattering those limbs, I retreated to watch the cleanup myself for a while. I needed to know when the goons had moved on so I could commence phase two. I expected to see some security lingering, but I was able to walk right up to the front door. The only explanation was that someone was waiting for me. Rain poured down the faces of the gargoyles perched high overhead, like stone guardians were crying their hearts out. Maybe this is what they meant by trickle-down economics. Can I help you? The name's Jordan. Morgan Jordan. Dr. Morgan B. Jordan. The B stands for Borden, and I'm here because I'm the protagonist of this story. Now, you have two choices. You can take me to the woman you're keeping hostage, or I can start spilling blood all over the place. To be clear, I mean, I won't spill your blood. This isn't that kind of a threat, although it is a threat. Awesome. Wait, what? I mean, I brought my own blood to spill. Wait, no. I, that's even more confusing. It's my blood, not my blood. I got a whole satchel full of blood bags, okay? And I'm not afraid to use them. The point is, it's going to stain real bad. No, dude, don't, please. We just finished mopping up all the carpets. Well, then you better get to cooperating. All right, fine. I'll do whatever you say, bro. <laughs> just don't make a mess. Take your shoes off and follow me. The goon with the black eye showed me through the maze of corridors, deep into the bowels of the ship house, down the spiral stairs, and into the dungeon itself. The only thing I could think was how strange it was for a man like Doves to leave his home operated by such a skeleton crew. Excuse me, Mr. Goon? <laughs> yeah. How much further until we get where we're going? It's right up here at the end of this conversation. <laughs> Are you the only guard working here tonight? Oh yeah, Mr. Doves wanted every available Goon focus on Project Homecoming. <laughs> They're all meeting tonight at Four Shadows Hotel and Ballroom to go over the plan. <laughs> what exactly is Project Homecoming. <laughs> Beats me. I'm not there going over the plan. Fair enough. Okay, here we go. The prisoner is locked inside of this room. <laughs> Be careful. She's a puncher. <laughs> I gave the goon a generous tip, thanked him for his time, and then unbolted and pushed open the door. <laughs> Hello, my name is Morgan Jordan. Hi, Morgan Jordan. It's funny. For a second there, when I saw your fedora and trench coat, I thought you were someone else. Are you here to kill me? Kill you? No, I'm far too squeamish for that. I'm here to rescue you. 
I barely even know who I am anymore. Those goons have been feeding me that Jekyll Hyde juice for days. All I know is that I came to this town looking for my old partner. His name Hold is- Hold that thought. I need to call my associate at Adden CPD and let him know he got the clues backwards. I found you, so that means he's walking into a pointless distraction that was set up by the main bad guy. You've reached Richard Detective. Hi, Dick. Good news. Uh, I... Unfortunately, I can't come to the phone right now. Seriously? Voicemail? Yeah, seriously. I'm going to be leaving town for a while. Something came up. Something that reminded me of a moment in a life I left behind. And I've decided it's time to stop running from the past. I'll be spending the next two to three weeks confronting some demons. Where I'm going, there isn't cell phone coverage. If you need me, or if this is some kind of emergency and you have to tell me something important, please get in touch with Dr. Morgan Borden Jordan at the Noir City Morgan Organ Storage. He'll know how to reach me. What? No! I won't! I'll see you next episode. For now, I'm going home. The voicemail box you reached is full. Goodbye. Son of a bitch! That was Noir City Blues, Episode 7, Me and My Shadows, Part 2. You heard the voices of Jack Townsend, Jeff Quash, Erica Durr, Helen Jacks, Matthew Morris, James Lanius, Andrew Ferrier, High Priest Roby, Rebecca Reesness, and Helen Schmel. It was written by Andrew Ferrier with an epilogue by Jack Townsend and big creative help from Jeff Quash. And the roles of Constable Dudgeon, Lord Lucius Gucius, and Vanessa Von Voom were improvised straight from the one-of-a-kind mind of James Lanius. Stay around for a bit more of that. Does she, is she scared of blood or is she like turned on by it? Uh, awful. Just like Willie's. Oh, great. Okay. I'll do that differently. (laughs) (laughs) Where are we? What are we doing here? God, that's so bad. I don't even know what that is. Air-oi. Where are we? No, 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 W, just air. Where are we? Air-oi. Air-oi. No, 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 W, it's just air-oi. 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 <laughs> it's just, just, just vowels. Air-oi. I don't know what you're doing here. Transformation sound. The chief turns into Vanessa Von Voom, a no-nonsense barmaid. All right. <laughs> <laughs> we should have had many more drinks before we started this session. We can come back to it if you want. No, no, it's good. I'm Vanessa Von Voom, <laughs> and I'm here to tell you that this is the worst cold pizza beverage that you can possibly conceive of. <laughs> Who made this? I had better cold pizza beverage from Paula... Not Paula Abdul, what's the one who cooks? Paula Abdul! Paula Makes a worse, better, cold pizza beverage! It's terrible! I hate this cold pizza beverage! Oh yeah, throw your hat in the ring now! We'll see how that goes! That'll be a good one, won't it? Throw your hat in the ring! Pin the tail on the donkey! Honestly, you should just give me the job! What are we talking about? <laughs> Oh my god. Uh, just make a threat. Like oh, you just, threat that's anything? all I need. Just like to, just to just as the button at the end. It, this is all gorgeous. Just a quick threat. Um if you throw your hat in the ring, I'll come for your hat. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's that, it. That good.